What's up, gang? This Ken Zerk, Ken Zillig, and Zika Milligan, and Billy Finn, and Twitter, and we are back on Fate Stay Night. I'm actually, I think I'm actually gonna upload this tomorrow, cause it's 6 p.m. right now. I normally upload, I normally record my videos around 8 a.m., 8 to 8 to 9 a.m. in the morning. All right, day three. All right, we on, we in the Fate route on day three. I'm, 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 I also happen to be in a fire. I don't know why, but I'm in a fire right now. I'm in a fire. Something burned. I'm at, I'm at my dad's house right now, so I apologize if my audio isn't as good. And I'm not gonna have my green screen either, as you can see. Uh, my, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm probably gonna record a few videos here. But, okay, day three, long day, long night. I'm in a fire. Houses crumble and people burn. No matter where I go, all I see is crimson. This is what I saw 10 years ago. It's a long forgotten memory of the past. I run through the scenery, recreating what happened. I know it's a nightmare, but there's no way to escape. I run and run, I keep running. Every time the scene ends with every time the scene ends with me as a child running out of energy and getting rescued. We have nightmares and shit. I wake up feeling wrong. A hand on my forehead tells me I'm sweating even though it's winter. Oh, it's late. The clock reads past six. I hear the soft sound of chopping from the kitchen. Sakura is early again. Not really the time to be impressed by what an early riser she is. I need to hurry up and get ready so I can help her with breakfast. Come on, chop chop little nigga, hurry up. Shiro, what are you gonna do today? It's Saturday, so do you have work in the afternoon? No, not today. I might help Issei out. Why do you ask? Oh, no reason. I was hoping you could swing by the dojo if you had nothing to do, because I'm kind of in a bind this month. Oh, they fixed the audio. It's not audio isn't running anymore. Okay, cool. A bind. Why? My bank account's hurting, you see. And it'd be a huge help if someone made me lunch for a while. Yeah, not fucking happening. It's your mess. You can afford to miss a meal or two, you fat fuck. Huh, I wasn't expecting anything from you, Shiro. The only person I could count on is Sakura. Right, Sakura? Never mind, it is running. Yes, if you don't mind having what I have, I can make you something. Ah, uh, good, good. Then let's eat less together today. Breakfast goes smoothly. Today's menu includes a typical size and the main dish is braised lotus root. Lotus juice? Hold on. Braised lotus juice, kanyaku, and chicken. Sakura probably didn't need to make such an elaborate... Burping. Sakura probably didn't need to make such an elaborate dish for breakfast, but I'm guessing she made extra to pack for lunch. Sakura is a member of the Kyudo Club, and Fujine is a club's faculty advisor. Nobody would think it was weird for the two of them to have the same lunch. Oh, by the way, Shiro, you woke up late today. Did something happen? Fujine looks my way as she sips her miso soup. As much as she just kind of hangs out there most of the time, she's pretty sharp about this kind of thing. Had a dream about the past and woke up feeling crappy. That's it. Oh, so the usual? Nothing to worry about then. <laughs> it's not an interesting topic for Fujine, so she shifts the conversation in another direction. She does not care about your past trauma, bro. She does not care. I don't care either. That doesn't bother me one bit. 10 years ago, I used to have nightmares a lot. Back when I couldn't shake the memory of that fire. But as time went on, these mem these nightmares grew less and less frequent, and I've gotten to the point where the dreams don't bother me anymore. I've been told my nightmares were pretty bad back then, though. Bujine was already with us by then, and she's been sensitive about changes in me since. Shiro, are you hungry at all? Your dream this morning hasn't affected you, has it? Nah, I'm fine. So stop using my dream as an excuse to steal my food. Hold on, bruh. My father to check my camera. Ah, I'm happy you see you turned out to be such a strong boy. I wish you wound up a little more gentle, though. Right back at you. 
Since I'm basically a little brother, I kind of wish you'd ended up being more delicate and sweet yourself. We both huff and turn our heads away from each other. Seeing that is a sign that I'm fine. Fujine smiles in relief. She's such a sweetheart. I love her. Honestly, I appreciate her consideration. But I know she'll get an ego about it if I say it directly, so I'll pretend to grunt and protest instead. He a little sundere boy. He a little sundere boy. <laughs> huh? Sakura looks puzzled by interaction. Haha. <laughs> Can I drink? Are you gonna let me drink? Can I drink? Fuck you. By the way, we're four away from a thousand. I just remembered that. I'm probably gonna stream after I record. Because I feel like I haven't streamed in a while on YouTube. But we're four away from a thousand right now. Come on, let's hit a thousand before I drop this. I'm not dropping this until we hit a thousand. How about that? I'm holding y'all ransom. Soon after Fujine leaves, I lock up and Sakura and I leave as well. Senpai. Senpai. I won't be able to come help out from tonight until Monday. Will that be okay? That's fine. Besides, it's the weekend. I bet you have friends to hang out with, so don't worry about me. Uh, no, that's not it. It really is for personal reasons, so I'm still going to practice at the club. So if you need anything, just come to the dojo and I'll figure things out. And I'm not, I'm not going to go out just because it's the weekend, so please, don't get the wrong idea. What? Sakura is acting mad suspicious, or rather, she seems nervous. Is your brother beating you? She, he hit, he hitting you again, huh? I don't know why, but it's probably just she can't come over the weekend. Got it. I'll go to the dojo if I need anything. Oh well, if it was her brother, then sh then the dojo wouldn't be a good place. Yes, that would be great. Sakura sighs in relief, but the moment Sakura lowers her gauge, her expression stiffens. Senpai. Senpai, your hand. Huh? Sakura is staring at my left hand. I look down and see blood trickling from it. Huh? I pull up my shirt sleeve. Yo! Yeah, blood. Why is my hand bleeding? The hell? Did I cut myself last night? I don't, I don't feel no pain. Looks like there's a welt on my hand. The bruise stretches all the way from my shoulder to the back of my hand. It looks like a snake that's trying to reach my palm from the top of my shoulder. Well, it doesn't hurt. I'm, I'm sure it'll go away soon. But I don't think it's anything to worry about. Okay, if you're sure, I won't worry. The sight of the blood probably made Sakura sick since she's keeping her head down. Sakura heads to the club while I head to the school building. The schoolyard is filled with athletic club members training. This morning is practically brimming with enthusiastic energy. But something feels strange. Everything in the school is as usual. The students exercising for morning practice are lively. And this new school building is spotless. Maybe it's just my imagination. And maybe somebody hit a domain expansion and everybody in the school is going to get melted. But when I close my eyes, the mood changes drastically. The building walls feel stained, like membranes have latched onto them, and the students themselves seem like empty dolls. <sighs> Maybe I'm just tired, yeah. I shake my head to clear it and head on the campus. School ends early on Saturdays. Classes end in the mornings, but by the time I finish helping Issei, the sun is starting to set. Guess it's time to get on home. I pack my bag and leave the classroom. Hold on, can I get one more freestyling? But then, oh, this pussy nigga, this bitch nigga, this piece of shit. Fuck this nigga, I hate this nigga. Hey, you're still here, Emiya. I forgot how I did his voice. I run into Shinji bitch ass. There are a few girls behind him making a small commotion. I can't believe you're still hanging around when you've got nothing to do. Alright, you're still kissing the student council's ass. Look at you. You get into the school's good graces even though you don't go into any clubs. 
I'm not helping the student council. I'm just helping the school by repairing old equipment since we all use it. Ha, uh, listen to you. Anything is a given according to Emiya. Did I ever tell you how much you pissed me off? Uh, don't remember. I probably wasn't listening if you did. You say that kind of shit all the time. I get it. So you're saying you'll fix anything as long as there's something that's in the school, huh? It's impossible to fix everything. The most I can do is take care of things. Ugly ass sprite. Then do me a favor. Our Kudo club's kind of in the mess right now. We've got bow strings lying around and the range hasn't been clean recently. If you got time on your hands, can you take care of that too? You used to be in the Kudo club, so shouldn't you be helping us too instead of just kissing the student council's ass all the time? What? Shinji? Didn't Miss Fujimura tell you to do all that? Yeah, you'll get in trouble if you don't do everything you were told. But all the shops will close if you start cleaning up now. If that guy's offering, then just let him do it. That's kind of mean. Plus, an outsider can't possibly clean everything up. That might not be right. Shinji just said he's a former club member. Maybe he can let him do it. The girls behind Shinji are awfully chatty. They seem to be Kudo members, but since I don't recognize any of them, they must be members Shinji recruited recently. I'm counting on you then. The key is in the usual place, so you just go in whenever. You don't mind, right, Emiya? Nah, I don't mind. I got some time on my hands, so it's no problem. Thanks. Let's go, everyone. This clown will do the boring chores for us. Don't leave me behind, Shinji! <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, good, good luck with the cleaner, Senpai. <laughs> she turned from a- She turned from a meat rider to a nigga. <laughs> I cleaned the Kudo Dojo without any problems since I'm familiar with it. It's a big room, so it took a while. But it's the kind of fun cleaning the place I used to spend so much time in until a year ago. Fuck! It's a big room, so it took a while, but it was kind of fun cleaning the place I used to spend so much time in until a year and a half ago. Midway through, I considered trying to shoot a bit, but decided not to. It would be rude to the owner of the bow. If I want to shoot, all I have to do is bring my own bow and visit. I look at the time, it's way past curfew. It's a little after 7. The school gates must be closed by now, so there's no need for me to rush out. Now that I look closely, I don't remember the dojo being so dirty before. There's dirt and grime all over the place. Like behind the bow racks in the club room. Well, I guess an hour or two. I guess another hour or two wouldn't make much of a difference at this point. I've already started, so I might as well clean every nook and cranny. Yes, sir! Hold on, we get we deep cleaning. I'm trying to deep clean some stop! The wind is starting to pick up. It's so cold, my cheeks start to sting. But Yuki typically isn't cold at night during the winter, but tonight's certainly an exception. My breath fogs the air with every exhale. I can't wait for Shinji to get stabbed. Can we skip to that part? No wonder it's darker than usual. The moon's hidden tonight. I look up and there's no light in the sky. The strong winds tend to... The strong wind sends the clouds seeding across the night sky. Curfew is long past, and there's no sign of life in the empty school. Not so much as a sound can be heard on campus, and it seems to be co covered with colder air than any place in town. I think I heard something. I do hear something. Is, is it coming from the schoolyard? That night, under the frosty sky, I guess I just got curious about the sound that broke the hushed silence. So I headed toward the sound to investigate. Nigga, not smart. I go to the schoolyard. Is that people? It looks that way, at least from a distance. It's just so damn dark. I need to get closer if I want to find out more. The sounds grow louder, more intense. I know that sound. It's clashing metal. It sounds like a fight. This is so stupid. What the hell am I thinking? I'm being stupid, obviously. Who would ever fight in a school courtyard with weapons like- It sounds like they mixing it! Oh my- You don't hear this? You don't hear this, Samurai X? 
Ruroni Kenshin battle going on? Is Ruroni Kenshin fighting that fake Jesus again? And then, bro, we got Himura Kenshin versus that one dude with the... I forget. We got Himura Kenshin versus... Damn, what was that dude with the bandages? I forgot his name. He was hard, though. He was so hard. It was probably a gut instinct that sensed the danger. Or maybe keeping out of sight as I approached what was just an odd stroke of luck. Where's the luck at? Whatever the reason, I hid behind a tree long big enough to conceal me. And took a closer look at the source of the sound. Dang, they mixing! There, my mind froze. What? I can't comprehend what I'm seeing. A man in red and a man in blue. The two of them are clad in armor so ancient it's several steps behind old fashioned. It's a ridiculous sight, but their vapid, deadly movements make clear their fight is no joke. No Eric B, hold on. No Rock Ken, hold on. I don't understand. I can't even follow their movements, they're too fast. Their movement looks so surreal. My mind can't function properly. The sound of the clash of metal is the only thing convincing me the two of them are actually fighting to the death. But there's one thing I'm sure about. They are not fucking human. They gotta be something else in the guise of humans. My magecraft training isn't why I know this. Anyone can see that these niggas are not human. To start, a regular nigga can't move like that. Nobody should get involved with whatever that is. I can feel their intent to kill even from a distance. I'm gonna die. My body instinctively knows before my brain kicks in that I will not live if I stay here. My heart, my, my heart racing is proof of that. Racing like NASCAR. I sense there are living things only designed to kill. No knife or plate would be a match for whatever they're wielding. They are clearly meant only to kill. I suddenly remember yesterday's murders. The family that fell victim is said to have been killed by a bladed weapon. Damn! I shouldn't stay and watch another second, but I can't move a muscle like I can hardly breathe. My mind is telling me to flee. But something else tells me they'll find me the second I move. More than any internal conflict though, I'm just paralyzed. I'm more than 40 meters away from them, but I still imagine getting stabbed in the back with that spear. I can't breathe. Get out of there. The sound stopped. The two figures separate and stand facing each other. Just I'm starting to feel a sense of relief that the fight's over. Another stronger sense of malice creeps over me. What? My heart feels like it's shriveled up in my chest. The numbness in my body turns to convulsions, and I clench my teeth in an effort to compose myself. Unbelievable. Who the hell is that guy? A nauseatingly high amount of magical energy flows into the man in blue. Kiritsuka once demonstrated to me how to draw in magical energy from one's surroundings. It was a kind of magecraft so beautiful that it impressed even an apprentice mage like me. But this is different. The same way even the simple act of drinking water can look revolting if done excessively. The man in blue appears to be binge eating. The sight is so extreme that anyone with magical energy would find it repulsive. He's going to die. The man in red is dead meat. The attack will be infused with more magical energy than anyone could possibly defend against. He's going to die. That inhuman, something in the guise of a man is going to die. But can I, fuck no, can I, fuck no, can I just let this happen? Fuck yes. <laughs> the question shakes me out of my paralysis. My body is suddenly free and I take a deep breath, deep breath. Who's there? The man in blue glares in my direction. Oh shit. The man in blue crouches in a way that tells me one thing. He's coming for my ass. Oh, my legs are moving before I even had the thought of running. The rest of my body finally realized it's time for me to flee for my life. And suddenly all my energy is being poured to do exactly that. Hold on, hold on. Someone I'm gonna do what nobody you and somebody not me human. Hold on. I don't remember why I ran through or how I got there, but I'm in a school building. Real fucking genius here. I regret my own actions as I huff and puff and blow the house down. I should have ran toward town. I've got the world's biggest idiot. I've gotta be the world's biggest idiot thinking I can escape by running into an empty building. A school of all places. 
There must have been other better places to hide. And what the hell convinced me I'd die if I didn't run to begin with? My chest burns from other running. My chest burns from this damn peak voice acting. I turn around, but I don't sense anything pursuing me. The only, um, the only, only sound is my own footsteps. I can finally stop. Don't stop. My feet can barely move another step. I gulp down lungfuls of air, trying to slow my heart down and breathe a sigh of relief. I survived. Should I tell him? Hey. <laughs> Should I tell him? <laughs> Should I tell him? What the hell was that? I try to recall what I just saw as I catch my breath. One thing's for sure. I definitely wasn't meant to see that. Things that looked... Things that looked human fighting in the schoolyard at night. That's all I can really remember. But I seen something else out the corner of my eye. I think there was also someone else. Can't remember what they looked like though. Honestly, I couldn't afford to look at anything other than the two figures locked in combat. But finally... Guess our little game of hide and seek ends here, huh? Oh, shit. The voice comes from right in front of me. Hey, you ran pretty far. I can't breathe. <laughs> My mind goes blank. I can't think. But I, I know that I'm going to die. Hey, man. Yo, chill. There's no way out of this. You get that, right? Don't worry. It's always like this when you're about to die. Nothing to be ashamed of. I'm just about to penetrate you with this long stick. And, and with that, he raises his spear. Sorry, kid. You were just unlucky today. But you, you saw what you saw, so you gotta die. No mercy. No compassion. His spear pierces my heart. Thank God Tosaka pulled up. I didn't even have time to dodge. No training I ever did prepared me for this. I knew I was going to die. I knew that spear was going to impale me, but I couldn't move. See, a nigga like me, I would have said. Ooh. And then I would have hit him with the Johnny K. Ah! Hold on, hold on. Hold on. I got space. I got space so I can do shit now. Hold on. I would have been like, hold on, hold on. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hold on. I would have been like, I would have been like, hold on. This, this is the spear, right? This, I would have been like, pow, right? And then I would have, hold on. I don't know how to do splits. I would hit him with the gun. I would have been like, oh, hold on. I got space, so I can I can act out now. I can act out. I got space. I can act out. Damn, we died. Uh, uh. The world distorts around me. My body grows cold. Numbness creeps from my fingertips into the rest of me. I cough up blood once. I felt like there should have been more, but it was just the one cough. That spear must have been special. My blood slows and grows stagnant. My heart just stops, all from a single strike of that spear. I can't see anything. I don't feel anything. I'm like a jellyfish. Floating in the dark sea at night. I stopped feeling pain long ago. The world has turned white. I'm the lone dark spot. So rather than being aware that I died, it just feels like everything around me has ceased to exist. I know this. I experienced the same thing 10 years ago. This is what dying feels like. Dead man tells no tales. But the weak dying is just the order of things. Bitch ass nigga. My eyes can't focus. It's a dirty thing you made me do. After what I just did, calling me a hero seems like a bad joke. Are you sure? You were just about to kill a whole school of kids, weren't you? I can only hear his voice. I know, I'm not complaining. At least I saw the girl's servant, so I'll head back. He sounds so irritated. Afterwards, I hear footsteps fading down the hallway. Archer, huh? I want to settle the score, but I'm in no position to ruin my master's plans. Damn, my master's a nasty one. The voice suddenly disappears. 
They must have jumped out the window. Afterwards, the footsteps I heard earlier stopped. There's an awkward silence. Then footsteps again. I can't hear that well anymore. Go after him, Archer. Lancer will probably be back to his master. We need to at least find out what his master looks like. I don't know who's talking. I muster up all my concentration as my mind fades, but I still can't put my finger on it. All I can hear now is the sound of my own breathing. My lungs must still be functioning. I hear a loud whistling sound coming from my mouth, like a passing typhoon. I'm impressed he's not dead yet. I sense somebody peering into my face. My breathing must be loud as the person reaches their finger out to try and close my mouth. Stop, seriously. Why does it have to be you? Whoever it is, they grit their teeth seeming troubled. The moment I hear that sound, the person touches me without hesitation. Forging and replacing an entire heart. Honestly, if this works, I should be a shoe-in for the clock tower. The voice sounds distressed. But at that moment, my fading consciousness finally flickers to nothing. Sensation returns to my body. Slowly, little by little, my bodily functions return. Like dewdrops trickling down a leaf. Drip, drip. What's going on? The person hovering over me is sweating, intensely focusing on where their hands are pressed against my chest. The next thing I know, the palm over my chest grows extremely hot. It's so hot, my corpse jolts and my cold, stagnated blood starts to flow again. I sense the person take a deep breath and sit down. I'm beat. Clink. I hear something fall. Well, I guess I couldn't help it. Forgive me, father. Your dad is just an extremely heartless person. That was it. The person mocks himself, then leaves. My heart resumes beating. Then I finally pass out. But it's not the everlasting sleep I expected. I fall into a slumber, bound to wake again. W Tosaka! W Tosaka, I fucks with you. I wanted to say this, but the way that the way that it paralleled to, to the prologue when um when Lancer was about to kill Archer, the way the di Shiro and Tosaka's dialogues um parallel was so hard. That was like the whole he's dead. He's gonna die. He's gonna die. Like the way that they were both seeing this and thinking that exact same thing in the exact same way. That was so hard. Ah I wake up suddenly. I feel sick and my entire body aches. Every time my heart beats, a sharp pain stabs my head. What happened? My intense headache prevents me from remembering anything. My body is cold and stiff, likely because I've been sleeping in the hallway for a long time. The only thing I can figure out is that my chest area of my uniform is torn and my blood stains the hall floor. My head feels hazy as I get up. The spot where I've been lying looks like a murder scene. Damn, seriously? Was my chest stabbed? I fight down a surge of nausea as I head into a nearby classroom. Staggering, I open a closet and pull out a rag and bucket. Uh-huh. What the hell am I doing? I'm still confused. I encountered something unbelievable, then it murdered me? But here I am, still trying to clean up after myself? Fucking stupid can I be? Ah, damn, it's not coming out. I wipe at the floor with the rag I found. I manage to wipe off the blood, despite the incredible weakness in my whole body, then gather everything scattered around the floor and shove it into my pockets. That may be my way of hiding any evidence. I must be doing some such a stupid stuff because my head's all hazy. I put the rag and bucket away and stagger out of the school like a zombie. My body heats up with every step I take. It's so cold outside and my body seems to be on fire. Can I drink? We in the crib. 
by the time I reached my house, the day that changed. There's nobody in the house. Sakura and even Fujin, they left long ago. I collapsed onto the floor. Lying on the floor is what lets me finally calm down a bit. I inhale deeply. My heart feels like it cracks every time my chest expands to draw in air. Actually, it's the opposite. It's not that my heart is cracking. The hole in my heart was just patched up, so expanding my chest opens the wound. So I really was almost killed. That's also not true. I wasn't almost killed, I was killed. But someone saved me and now I'm alive. I wonder who it was. I would really like to thank them. They were in the area, it means they could be involved with the people fighting. But it still doesn't change the fact that they saved me, so I need to thank them properly one day. Ah, oh, shit, my heart! Oh. The moment I drop my guard, the pain returns. At the same time, nausea strikes me. Ah! Ah! I sit up to hold the nausea at bay. Ah! Ah! I place my hand on my bare chest when my uniform is torn. I might have been saved, but my chest was, as a matter of fact, pierced. The feeling, the agony of the spear tip piercing my chest is something I can easily forget. Damn, I'm gonna have nightmares about this for a while. <laughs> when I close my eyes, I feel the spear thrust again. I try to shake the delusion off and I make every effort to regain my composure. Good, I'm calming down. This must be thanks to my nightly training. My thoughts clear as I take slow, deep breaths, then fear, fever and nausea abate a bit. So, about what happened. The man in blue and man in red. They looked human, but I know they're not. They could have been ghosts of some kind, but I've never heard of ghosts having forms that allowed them to interact with humans like that. And the thing was talking, which makes it a little harder to believe it was a ghost if it had a will of its own. From what I heard, the only spirits that possess physical bodies are the elemental types. But I thought elementals didn't look human. Well, that's not the issue here. There's a more fundamental issue. The two are trying to kill each other. And there was a robbery and murder at a house nearby. Very stuff like that's been plaguing Fuyuki lately. With all this in mind, the only conclusion I can come to is that the situation is out of control. Only the old man was alive right now. I guess I was kind of whiny, but I'll put it down to the patched up chest wound that still feels raw. Okay. Idiot. I've already decided to do whatever I can, even if I don't understand the situation. I can complain later. First of all, I need to decide whether I should get involved or not. Fuck no. Oh shit, home invasion? The bell on the roof of the house rings. No matter what anyone says, this house is still a mage's house. A bounded field is set around it. So even if there's an intruder in the area, an alarm rings. A burglar at this hour? I berate myself for my own idiocy. Of course it's not a burglar. Given the timing, right after that weird incident, there's definitely an intruder. It's no burglar, it's an assassin. They're here to take a life, not property. Because that man said so himself. You saw what you saw, so you gotta die. The house is dead silent. The same murderous intent I felt at school creeps closer through the hushed darkness. I gulp. A chill prickles like needles along my spine. It's no illusion and it's not my imagination. I know that the moment I leave this room, I'll be stabbed again. I desperately try to contain my scream. The instant I scream, the assassin will just leap right in and kill me. And that would be a repeat of what happened before. I'm not prepared and I'm going to get impaled again. My breathing grows labored as soon as a thought crosses my mind. I'm mad. I'm mad at myself for being afraid. And I'm mad that I put myself in a situation where I'll so easily lose my life after I was saved earlier the same damn day. I grit my teeth and hold my hand tight over my wounded chest to restrain myself. I need to get used to this. It's the second time. It's the second time I'm about to die. That alone motivates me not to die so pathetically as last time. Am I not a mage after all? And if I can't even defend myself from this, what are my eight years of training for? 
Bye. Yeah. Bring it on, pussy. I'm not gonna agonize over complicated things anymore. Right now, I just need to drive away whoever's here. I need to find a weapon. I may call myself a mage, but the only thing I can do is reinforce something that might work as a weapon. I need a weapon to fight, after all. There's plenty of things that might work as a weapon in the storehouse, but I'm not anywhere near there. If I leave the living room and get ambushed, I'm just gonna expose myself, and it'll be a repeat of what happened earlier. It won't be as easy, but I've gotta find a weapon here. Something long and thin would be good. My opponent's weapon is choice of spear, so a knife would be all but useless. A wooden sword would be best, but I obviously don't have one just lying around. Something around here that might be suitable as a weapon. Whoa, there's only the poster Fujine left. I can't help but feel utterly dejected. But the desperation makes me all the more determined. The situation's so bad, it can't really, it can't really get any worse. And all that's left for me to do is move forward until I have no energy left. Trace on. I speak my incantation and inject magical energy into the rolled up 60 centimeter poster. I try to imbue as much magical energy as I possibly can into the poster to solidify it. Since it needs to work as a weapon to go up against that spear. Got position analyze. I focus my consciousness. Magical energy permeates the poster as if I'm staining against fibers with my own blood. Composition reinforce. I feel I've hit the end. Right before magical energy spreads throughout the poster and spills out, I say. Trace off. I cut off the connection with the poster. I tremble with excitement. The poster is hard as steel, but its weight remains the same as before. It's turned out great for a hastily imp improvised sword. I did it. How long has it been since my strengthening magecraft succeeded? My magecraft hasn't worked ever since Kiritsugu died. And so for it to succeed at a time like this is ironic. Either way, now I can... I may be able to defend myself. I at least have some discipline and swordsmanship. I grip the poster with both hands and stand in the middle of the room. If I stay here, I'm dead. But I, think, I don't think I can make it outside the mansion either. So I just need to head for the shed and make a stronger weapon there. Because I start trying to hype myself up. Every hair on my body stands on end. I'm not sure when he got in, but the guy drops from the ceiling straight toward me. A silvery flash strikes my head from above. I can only assume he came through the ceiling and he descends on me, meaning to skewer my head. Why you? I roll forward in a frantic dodge. The man lands with inhuman grace as I clumsily roll out of the way. I stop myself quickly and get to my feet, makeshift sword at the ready. The guy turns lazily, looking bored. You're making this whole thing kind of a pain. I was trying to be nice, thinking it'd hurt a lot more if you saw me kill you. He shifts his spear to his other hand in a slow, fluid movement. I don't know why, but it doesn't seem as aggressive as he did at school. Which means, which might give me a chance at escaping him. I can't believe I have to kill the same humor humans. I can't believe I have to kill the same human twice. Guess the living world is a meat grinder no matter the era. He's complaining to himself like I'm not even here. I slowly retreat back out of the room. Only three more meters until I reach the window. I'll run out. Then it's only about 20 meters to the shed once I reach the yard. Then I should quickly see ya. Don't wander around anymore, kid. He says it almost absentmindedly. Like it was just an afterthought. Pain shoots up my right arm. It all happens in an instant. He thrusts his spear forward, not even giving me time to react. I should have died for a second time there. The makeshift sword in my hand spared me from that fate. He probably thought I should have been holding up rolled up paper. He struck it as if I, had, as if I hadn't been holding anything at all. But the reinforced sword, paper sword deflected the attack so it only grazed my arm. Interesting trick you've got there, boy. His expression goes blank. His casual attitude from earlier vanishes entirely. He watches me now like a feral animal eyeing its prey. Crap, I was clearly wrong thinking things would be okay. The thing before me is some kind of demon, unbound by logic. 
I keenly realized letting my guard down even for a second was beyond ludicrous. That's right. Desperate as things are, I should have made a break for the window right after whatever miracle let me dodge his strike from above. I thought you were some kid, but I can sense a bit of magical energy from you. So that's how you're alive even if I stabbed you in the heart. The end of his spear points towards me. I can't block that shit. <laughs> There's no way I'll be able to block that swift attack. I could have at least braced myself if I had a sword, no matter how fast he might be with it. But he's holding a spear. A sword is a whole line, but a spear only has a point. How am I supposed to block a point when I can't even see how fast it moves? Fine, I'm gonna have a little fun. The man drops into a low- Hold on, I wanna hear this beat drop. That was hard though. Damn, I keep thinking the beat goes up. They edging me. The man drops into a lower stance in a flash. The spear swings, the spear swings in sideways. I instinctively parried the bow, blow, blow aimed in my face. Good boy. Come on, here comes another. It's a cyclone. I'm not sure how it's moving his spear in this small room but it traces a beautiful arc without even touching the walls. A swing comes from the opposite side, aiming at my torso. The force of the swing bends my makeshift sword as I try to parry. Monstrous! Is that a hammer he's swinging? Damn, the numbness in my arms is telling me they might be broken. Are you? I instinctively swing my sword. He must be mocking me with the way he keeps flicking his spear at my sword without drawing back at all. Numbness creeps into my arms after, the ongo after, after going on the attack. My makeshift sword bends even more, and the man's spear changes trajectory slightly. You're hopeless. I gave you an opportunity, but you wasted it. Then again, I guess expecting a good fight from a mage is asking too much. He moves like this is just a game. Such confidence. He'd have been letting me take a swing at him after he took a couple shots at me. I wasted, I wasted my one opportunity as nothing more than a stopgap. So he sees no point in continuing this. What a disappointment you turned out to be. Okay, time to die, kid. The man readies to spare again. Don't jump to conclusions, bitch! During that microscopic ending, Say what you want, dumb fuck! I don't, I don't turn back to look, I just leap backward through the window. My back shatters the window as I, and I roll out into the courtyard. I roll a few times, spring upward and... I blindly make my next move. I twist my entire body and swing behind myself. I manage to bat the man's spear aside and he hesitates for just an instant. I knew it. If I jumped out the window, he was going to have to chase after me, and he would catch up to me and go in for the kill before I had a chance to get up. So I expected his fatal blow and swung my sword to the side with all my might. It was a risky move. He'd have killed me if I'd been a second late, and I'd have been just as dead if I was early too. But knowing the incredible gap in our skill, I figured there's no way I could have been early. The only thing I had to do was get up as quickly as I could and parry the attack I knew was coming at my back. The gamble pays off and I swing the, and my swing deflects his spear. I quickly reposition myself. Now I just need to run to the shed while he's still confused. Tobe. Fly. <laughs> Shit. He's not holding his spear anymore, and he's right in front of me. He turns on the spot and he turns on the spot in a roundhouse kick! Oh shit. He flipped, he spun us around. Okay. He hit us with that, that rain, bro. What was Rain's real name again? I forgot. Scenery goes flying by. My chest goes numb where he kicked me. I can't breathe. The biggest surprise, I'm actually flying through the air. I never thought a guy kicking me would send me into the air like a damn ball. I fall hard onto my back. I slam into a wall, the impact likely breaking my back and slide down the ground. 
I can't breathe. My vision blurs. By a stroke of luck, he'd thrown me into the shred that I wanted to reach. I leaned against the wall trying to rouse myself. I tried to track the man through blurry eyes. He kicked me nearly 20 meters away. The guy picks his spear up and rushes straight at me. I'm gonna die. There's nothing I can do now. He's going to reach me. If I don't want to die, I need to get up and parry his hit. The tip of the spear surges. I can't even look back at him. My body on the verge of collapse practically greets his spear. Get on your feet if you're a man! What dumb luck. My knees gave out. I can't hold myself up. The spear goes over my head and violently impales the shed's heavy door, pushing it open. This is my last chance. If only I could get inside the shed, there could be something I could use as a weapon. I crawl into the shed on all fours, just then. This ends now. He launches a spear at me. Damn you! I block it. I open up the rolled up poster and use it as a single use shield. The impact makes a dull sound. The poster on road probably isn't as strong. It blocks the spear, but it tears apart, returning to a normal bit of paper. The spear impact flings me against the wall. I fall into my ass and try to get my heart beating again after it feels like it's trying to quit on me. The moment I raise my head to try to get something I use as a weapon, it's over. But that last move of yours surprised me, kid. The man points his spear in front of my face. I can't do anything else now. His spear is pointed directly at my heart. I know this feeling. It's a scent of death, assailing my nostrils, reminding me of the pain I felt a few hours ago. Honestly, I don't get it. You're quick-witted, but your maze crap's complete shit. You've got potential, but maybe you were just too, just too young. I don't hear the man's voice. My attention is focused on the weapon pointed at me. Obviously. The moment he thrusts, I'm dead. What else is there to think of at this point? I doubt it. But maybe you were the seventh one. Either way, this is the end for you. His arm jerks. I wasn't able to see his movements earlier, but now I see every last one in slow motion. There's a bolt of silvery light. The tips like it's being the tip seems like it's being drawn towards my heart. Blood will gush from the wound in just a second. I know this feeling. That sensation of iron piercing my body. That taste of blood that will well up in my throat. That feeling of the world around me fading. I experienced all of it earlier today. And now I'm just gonna have to experience it again? Really? I don't understand. Why do I have to be the one who goes through this? This is bullshit. No, I can't die in vain in a place like this. I was saved. If I was saved, I can't just die like this. I need to live to fulfill my obligations. I won't be able to do that if I'm dead. The spear's still going to impale me, though. The tip will tear through my flesh, break my ribs, and bore into my heart. I'm mad. It shouldn't be so damn easy to kill people like this. I'm going to die in this bullshit. I'm going to die twice in a single damn day. Everything is fucking bullshit. I'm gonna die and I didn't even have an opportunity to be afraid of this whole damn mess. No way in hell. I... I'm not gonna let myself die senselessly to the likes of a bitch nigga like you! Huh? Uh, A is an absolutely right word in this moment. What? Like magic. The goat appears out of a bright light shining from behind me. I can't think. All I know is that that figure is a girl. I hear a high-pitched sound. And the moment the figure appears, it pushes aside the sword pressed against my heart. The spear pressed to my heart. The steps between me and the man without missing a beat. Are you effing kidding me? The seventh servant? He tries to regain his composure after his spear is pushed aside as the girl brandishes something in her hand. Sparks fly. Hard metal clashes and sparks fly again. The man stomps his foot after blocking the woman's attack. He must have realized he's at a disadvantage. 
because he leaps out of the storehouse with bestial agility. She must intimidate him, but she quietly turns toward me. The wind is strong today. The clouds slide away and the moon shines through the brief instant. The silver moonlight shines into the shed, illuminating the girl who appears like a knight. Speechless. And it's not because I'm confused by all the things that just happened. The girl before me is so astonishingly beautiful that I'm lost for words. The girl's eyes, like precious jewels, stare at me without emotion. I ask of you, are you my master? Her voice sounds so... valiant. Huh? Master? I can only repeat her words back to her. I don't understand what she's saying, nor do I know who she is. All I know is that this slender, delicate-looking girl is similar to the man outside. She says nothing, continuing to look at me in silence. I don't know how to describe her. She's special. So special that I forgot entirely about the man outside, even though he might attack at any moment. Time seems to have stopped. Even the fear of death I felt moments ago vanishes. There's only the girl standing before me. Servant Saber, I have come in response to your summons. Master, please give me your orders. It's the second time she speaks. And the moment I hear the word Master and the name Saber, echoes in my ear. Pain shoots through my left hand. It's hot like being branded by an iron. I unconsciously press the back of my left hand. Taking that as a sign, the girl silently nods her beautiful head. Henceforth, my sword creates your destiny and our fates shall be intertwined. And thus our contract is formed. What? Contract for what? I'm still a mage in training, so I understand what those words mean. But the girl doesn't respond to my question. She simply looks away with the same grace she'd shown when she nodded. She turns towards the shed's ruined door. Outside, the man readies his spear. She moves faster than expected. The girl in Knight's armor leaps out of the shed without hesitation. What? I forget about the pain I feel and I get up to follow her. She can't possibly go up against that guy. No matter how heavily armored she is, she's smaller than I am. Stop! The echoing clang drowns out my words. What? I can't believe what I'm seeing. My head really does go blank this time. Who the hell is she? The clash of swords echoes around me. The moon slips behind the clouds and the yard grows dark once again. And within the darkness, sparks fly and steel strikes steel. Without saying a word, the spear-wielding man meets the girl who leapt, behind, from, from, who leapt from the shed. She parries his spear and knocks away his other successive attacks, driving him back with each attack. I can't believe it. This girl, Saber, is somehow overpowering that man and this beat is hard! The battle has begun. What happened between that man and I earlier doesn't even count as battle. A battle? That's a fight between two people, each able to kill each other. No matter the difference in ability, it can be still be called a battle as long as both are able to kill the other. In that sense, these two are fighting a battle. The man attacks her, swinging his spear so quickly I can't even see his strikes. Somehow, she parries his every attack perfectly with something as she closes in on him. Dang! The man backs up slightly, clicking his tongue hatefully. He holds his spear vertically to ward off her attacks on the side. From the moment his spear glows, his attack almost looks like it caused an explosion. The man's spear sparks as if electrified every time whatever the every time whatever weapon the girl was wielding strikes it. 
that man and I could both tell what it was. Its furious magical energy, so dense it could actually be seen. Her attacks are charged with incredible amounts of magical energy. The unbelievable amount of magical energy crackles along her opponent's weapon every time they make contact. The sheer force of her attacks must be staggering. If the man's spear can't if the man's spear strikes are precise, like sniper rifle, her blows must be the overpowering blast of a shotgun. Even the girl even each of the girl's attacks bathe the yard in flickering light, and yet, that's not what's overpowering the man. Coward! Why are you concealing your weapon? The man curses the girl as he evades her unrelenting attacks. She doesn't respond other than to step up her attack with her invisible weapon. You. The man retreats, having hardly so much as a chance to counterattack. Her weapon is invisible. Without being able to determine the weapon's range, you'd be reckless to go in for an attack. That's the trouble with an invisible weapon. But she's definitely got something in her hands. I can't make out anything of its shape or length. Maybe it's transparent to begin with. No matter how many times sparks fly from it, I can never get I can never get a look at the weapon's profile. Parrying or strike must be taking a lot out of man. His movements aren't as sharp as they have been. It's the first sound the girls makes. She attacks all the more furiously. It's a merciless, unyielding dance of blades. The flying sparks reminds me of a blacksmith striking iron. And a spear-wielding man continues defending himself as he disapprovingly clicks his tongue. Honestly, I can't help but admire the man, even though he tried to kill me. He's able to defend himself against an invisible weapon, relying only on reading the girl's swings and footwork. But that's all he can do. When an opponent is so completely on defense, the only thing you need to do is beat them down. The girl steps in closer. She smashes down, striking with all her might. Don't get carried away, fool! Seeing his chance, the man disappears. Or rather, he retreats back as if to disappear. The girl's swing cuts through the air and smashes into the ground, kicking up dust. Her massive swing, which seems to be a fatal blow against the cornered spearman, proved easy to dodge. That fool, what was she thinking? Even I could tell what happened, even at this distance. Her careful, precise attack earlier may have worn the man down, but the tremendous swing meant to deal the finishing blow wouldn't ever touch him. The relentless attacks must have put an incredible strain on the man's body as he tried to defend himself. Yet he suppressed that pain for a single moment to jump away. He knew that her last attack would determine the victor. The man jumps back several times, several meters. It comes in a strike once again. <sighs> All right, jumps back several meters and comes in a strike once again. The moment, once again, the moment his feet touch the ground, he jumps in a triangular pattern and leaps toward the girl as if revisiting his steps. The girl swings still embedded in the ground. It's a fatal opening. The red spear turns in less than a second. The girl twists her body around like a top, while her sword is still embedded in the ground. The whole thing happens in a matter of seconds. The man sees his mistakes and tries to correct, as the girl uses his brief moments to use her whole body to attack. Both the man and the girl seem unsatisfied though. Both struck intending to kill. Both survived. So everything leading to this moment was in vain. The two opened a bit of distance between themselves. They both quietly stare at each other. The strain of battle inflicted on them seems to be too much. What's wrong, Lancer? Would you tarnish the name of all warriors of the spear by just standing there? If you aren't going to attack, then I will. <laughs> Running to your death already? Fine by me. But let me ask you one thing first. Is your noble phantasm a sword? He phrases his question bluntly. He glares as if trying to look through her. Who can say? It might be a battle axe, a spear, or sword, perhaps even a bow. Keep talking, Saber. Somehow this conversation seems to be amusing him. 
The man called Lancer briefly lowers his spear. It looks as if he's saying he doesn't want to fight anymore. Huh? The girl seems puzzled by Lancer's move, but I know what his stance means. I remember the fight at school a few hours ago. It's the killer move that was supposed to have ended the battle. I'm going to ask you one more thing. Since this is the first time we've met, want to call it even for now? Not a bad deal, right? Your master over there looks pretty useless, and my master's a big coward who won't even show their face. Don't you think it's in both our best interests to hold off fighting until we're in better conditions? I refuse. You will die here, Lancer. Is that so? Man, I just came here to check things out. I wasn't going to stick around once a servant appeared. The air wavers. The surroundings appear to distort. Lancer lowers his stance. A chill creeps into the air. The same thing happened earlier. Magical energy rumbles as it forms a vortex at the tip of the spear. A noble phantasm. The girl readies her weapon and glares at her enemy. I don't need to speak up. She knows very well how dangerous the enemy is. She is the one confronting him. See ya. Your heart is mine. The beast quick kicks the ground. Lancer appears in front of the girl so quickly he may as well have teleported. He takes his spear and aims at her feet. Even to me, that seems like a poor choice. I can't see any way an attack would be effective if the spear pointed at the ground in front of her feet. Apparently thinking the same, the girl leaps over the spear toward Lancer intent on striking him down. But at that moment, his words alone radiate immense magical energy. The spear released from below angles toward the girl's heart. No, my goat! How are you dying in your first appearance? Her body hangs in the air. The blow sends her flying in a wide arc. She smashes heavily into the ground. She's bleeding. She had been unscathed until now, but her heart is pierced, and she's bleeding profusely. A curse. Or a reversal of fate. I'm just as bewildered, but watching from afar may have given me a better perspective on how bizarre that attack was. The spear had been aimed at her feet, I'm sure of that. But then it just changed direction, moving and stretching impossibly to pierce the girl's heart. And yet the spear itself neither stretched nor changed direction. It seemed bizarrely as if the spear had been thrust into her chest from, begin from the beginning, almost naturally. It wasn't as simple as the spear changing its trajectory and piercing the heart. The spear didn't change its course. It altered its truth to make that happen. The moment he spoke those words and released the spear, the intent of piercing her heart had been realized. Essentially, his attack reversed cause and effect. The result of the attack pierced the victim's heart is predetermined, so the spear's trajectory is merely an afterthought to establish the facts. It's a demonic splinter that breaks through all defenses. The moment it determines it's the target, the spear pierces the heart every time it's used without exception. How can anyone defend against such a completely insane attack? No matter what target, no matter what effort the target makes to evade, the spear will always pierce their heart, which makes it fatal. And a cursed spear that always pierces the opponent when used. However, the girl evades by a hair breath. The spear did penetrate her but it didn't hit anything vital. Her actions in invading, in invading the spear seemed to be more impossible than the spear itself. The moment the spear was thrust, the girl turned in reverse direction with an incredible effort of will and strength, as if she knew what was going to happen. She, she was either incredibly lucky or had just enough protection to dampen the spear's curse. Whatever it is, the girl managed to avoid the fatal blow and so survives Lancer's ultimate attack. The girl tries to get her labored breathing under control. Although she had been using a lot of it, blood stopped seeping from her wound, and even the wound itself is closing up. 
So this is what a truly extraordinary person can do. She knew she wasn't, I knew she wasn't normal, but she's more than outstanding. In terms of her skills in the fight against Lancer, in terms of incredible amounts of magical energy used for every attack, her body recovering on its own, she is obviously superior to Lancer. But that was only up until now. She may be healing even now, but her wounds are deep. If Lancer attacks now, she won't be able to defend herself. And yet, even though he's at an overwhelming advantage, Lancer doesn't move. He audibly grinds his teeth, and he glares at the girl. How the hell did you evade my, fa my fatal gay bulk, Saber? His voice seems to rumble up from the ground itself. Did you say gay bulg? So you're Ireland's child of light. Lancer's expression darkens. His hostility dissipates and he clicks his tongue in annoyance. Damn, I screwed that up. If I pull this move out, it's really gotta be fatal. Sometimes being famous is a bit of a pain, you know? The oppressive mood lightens. Lancer no longer... Link no longer seems to have any intent on attacking the wounded girl. He turns his back as he walks to the corner of the yard. Now that my identity has been revealed, my usual servant rules say we should fight to the death. But like I said, my master is a coward. They're even telling me to retreat since my spear failed. Are you running away, Lancer? Yeah. Follow if you like, Saber. Just know that if you do, I'll kill you. He lightly bounces off the ground. It's a wonder how agile he can still be, but Lancer jumps effortlessly over the fence and disappears before anyone can stop him. I don't have water anymore. Wait, Lancer! The injured young girl turns and starts running in pursuit. You've got to be kidding me! I cross the yard as fast as I can. I don't stop her. If I don't stop her, she'll go after him and maybe get herself killed. It turns out I don't need to chase after her. She tries to jump over the wall, but the moment she crosses the jump, she doubles over and grabs her chest. I hurry over to check on her. Well, I'd intended to just approach and call out to her, but that went right out the moment I got near her. She is completely unbelievable. The shining silver armor she wears look extremely heavy. The clothing she's wearing, dated as it is, is bright, vivid blue. I've never seen anything like it. No, her clothes are not what really enthralls me. She's absolutely beautiful. Her golden hair illuminated by the moonlight. It's extremely fine as spun gold. Her face is graceful with a trace of innocence. Her skin white, her smooth white skin all but glows in the moonlight. I'm speechless. Her beauty completely takes my breath away. How'd this happen? Seeing a girl wounded in a fight made me absolutely furious. As I stand there gawking, the girl remains silent, her hand clamped over her chest. I managed to quit staring pretty quickly. She lifts her head and lets her hand fall from her chest, her pain seemingly to have eased. She looks directly at me. I don't know quite how to respond to that gaze, but then I notice something. Your wounds, gone. The spear missed her heart, but it did pierce her chest. Yet there's no outward sign of a wound. I've heard there's a kind of healing magecraft, but she didn't seem to use anything like that. That must mean she can heal herself no matter how wounded she is. My mind switches gears. I shouldn't be gawking at her. This girl is unbelievable and I absolutely should not let my guard down around her until I know who she is and what's going on. Hey, who the hell are you? I take, I take half a step back as I ask the question. What do you mean? I am Saber, a servant. You were the one who called me here, so you need an ask. Saber? Servant? Yes. So please address me as Saber. She says it so casually. There's a touch of contempt in her tone, but it remains mostly gentle, and hearing her voice makes my head go blank. What? Why the hell am I getting agitated? I see. That's a weird name. 
I cover my burning face with my with a hand as I respond stupidly. But I honestly don't know what else to say. Besides, how else would I respond when I just ask her what the hell she is? I mean, how else would she respond when I just ask her what the hell she is? And it'd be rude for me to, to not respond. I'm Shiro. My name is Shiro Emiya and I live here. There's something wrong with me. I'm saying the dumbest things. But well, she did give her name. It's only polite that I give mine. I know I'm confused, but it's still important to remain rational no matter who I'm dealing with. The girl Saber just keeps watching me in my confusion. She moves not an inch. Forget all that. That's not what I was asking. It's that I know very well that you are not a typical master. Huh? Yet you are still my master. As, as long as we have formed a contract that will not betray you, you needn't be on your guard around me. Crap. I hear her, but I couldn't be more lost. The only thing standing out to me is that she keeps referring to me as master. You've got it wrong. My name's not master. Very well, then I will call you Shira. Yes, I like that better. The moment she said my name, I thought my face would actually burst into flames. Isn't it a bit more normal to call someone by their last name when you first meet? Wait, why would you choose to dress me that... Ah, shoot. A strange sensation tingles through my left hand. It's hot. The back of my hand is burning. A strange pattern appears on the back of my left hand like a tattoo. Those are called command spells, Shiro. There are three. There are three spells that. that are, there are three spells. There are. Uh, there are three spells which commands a servant's obedience. They are a master's very life, so please use them carefully. What? On you, Shiro. Please heal me. Her tone is cold now. It seems she's not focused on me, but something elsewhere. Wait, are you asking me? Sorry, I don't know how to use complicated magecraft like that. And you're already healed anyway. Saber frowns. I feel like I've said something that disappoints her. And I shall face them as is. My regeneration has only repaired the superficial damage. But one more battle shouldn't affect me. One more battle? What do you mean? There are two enemies outside. From what I can sense, I'm sure I can defeat them in a few seconds. Saber leaps over the wall effortlessly. Just like Lancer, she makes it look easy. And now I'm just alone in the, in the yard. Enemies outside. I realize what she means as soon as I say it. Wait, are you gonna keep fighting? I move without thinking. I run as fast as I can toward the gate. I reach the gate, unlocking it with trembling fingers and jump out. Saber, are you here? I strain to see the darkness. Clouds have completely obscured the moon, leaving it pitch dark. Now of all times, okay. But I hear something nearby. There! I run to the empty blah blah blah. It happens all in an instant. I see a familiar man in red and Saber fighting. Saber rushes him and breaks through his guard in a swingle sweep. She easily cuts at the man in red. Saber raises her arm, ready to... But before she's able to take his head, an, an incredibly powerful magecraft causes him to vanish. Saber doesn't stop. She dashes right at the person standing behind the man in red and effortlessly negates the potent magecraft they unleashed. What? I knew she was strong, but this is just unreal. That was sort of an intervention magecraft way beyond anything I'm capable of. My old man might have been able to cast something like that with a bit of weight to it, but I'm not sure even a first-rate ma even a first-rate mage could just cast something so powerful at like the drop of a hat like that. Even so, Saber nullifies the mage crowd as if it were nothing. The enemy must be a mage, which means this match's outcome is decided. The mage's attack doesn't work on Saber, and Saber drives at them mercilessly. The mage falls backward with a thud. The enemy miraculously dodges Saber's attack, but they can't move anymore. Saber corners the enemy and levels her invisible sword at them. My mind freezes. Maybe it's a, mon maybe it's a momentary glimmer of moonlight, but I, s but I see then that Saber is attacking a human. 
I can't tell who it is specifically, but the image of Saber fighting, killing someone, their blood staining her hand suddenly fills my mind. Saber moves in. She's gonna slit their throat with that invisible sword. Saber, stop! I scream as loud as I can. Her blade stops cold. It's probably best for my sanity that I can't see her blade. But the tip of that invisible sword isn't wet with their opponent's blood just yet. Stop! I beg you, Saber. I glare at her as we speak. I glare at her, I glare at her as I speak. If I'm going to stop her, I need to prepare myself to give everything I've got to do so. Why are you stopping me, Shiro? She is Archer's master. I must put an end to her. I must put an end to her here and now. No, Saber. No, Saber has absolutely no intention of stopping. She only stopped because I told her to. But she still holds her sword at the ready. I'm telling you, wait. You keep calling me master, but I still don't understand what's going on. If you're going to address me that way, then wouldn't it be right to explain yourself first? Saber doesn't answer. She just stands there staring at me. This nigga. <laughs> He's like, this nigga. See, back in my day, we had y'all on slave boats. <laughs> oh my, hold on, stop, Zeke, stop. We're going about this wrong, Saber. I don't even know who you are, but I'll listen if you tell me, so please, don't do this. Saber is silent. She still holds her sword to her opponent and stares at me. Her lips downturn in dissatisfaction. What do you mean, don't do this? Is that an expression of your idealistic belief that people should not needlessly harm another? Huh? Don't needlessly harm another? Well, yeah. It's better to avoid conflict as much as possible. But I'm not so soft-hearted as to feel sorry for someone who's attacking me. So you're saying that nobody should take the life of another, even should they be an enemy, correct? I will not obey such an order. Once enemies must be defeated, if you still wish to stop me, then use your command spell to order me. Huh? I'm talking about you. A girl shouldn't go swinging swords around, especially if she's already hurt. Oh, wait. I don't even know if that's a sword to begin with. Uh, yeah, anyway, you shouldn't be doing this. In that moment, Saber's mouth falls open in stunned silence. I don't know how much time passes with her just standing there like that. So, I'm wondering when Saber here is going to lower her sword. The person who'd fallen to the ground speaks up out of nowhere. Saber instinctively grips her sword. Give it up. I would never lower my sword in the face of an enemy. Even though your master is telling you to? Is that so? I didn't know servants, especially Sabers, to fight their masters. Saber grits her teeth. But she lowers her sword, loosening her grip a bit. She must have put her sword away or something, because she seems suddenly much less hostile. Okay, so I can stand up now, right? Whoever it was that's been on the ground finally stands. They act brazen as they pat the dirt on their bottom. Wait a minute. That's... You're a toe sucker! Yes, good evening, Emiya. Rento Saka replies with the biggest smile on her face. Ah, uh, This is unbelievable. I don't know what to think anymore. The way she greets me so casually makes me question whether everything that happened was real. Um, so you were the one who cast that magecraft earlier, which makes you a mage. Well, we're pretty much the same, so I guess there's no use hiding it anymore. Hearing her be so blunt about it makes me seem like the idiot here. Anyway, let's talk inside. I bet you have no clue about what's going on, right, Emiya? As she says that, she walks toward the entrance to my house. Uh, wait, Tosuka, what the hell are you thinking? At that moment, when Tosuka turns around, her smile has changed into something completely different. Don't be silly. I'm thinking about a lot of things, and that's why I'm offering to talk. Emiya, I know you're surprised by all the things that's just happened, but sometimes you just have to accept certain things and you'll wind up dead. This, by the way, is one of those times. She glares at me. I can 
see actual animosity in her eyes. I'm glad you understand. Now let's get inside. Tosuka walks through the gate. She seems really pissed. Well, I don't blame her. Just a moment ago, she had a sword pointed at her. She was about to die. But still, maybe it's my imagination, but I think the Tosuka at school and the one I see right now are completely different people. And this is just weird as hell. Rento Saka, the most popular girl in school, the girl I admire, is walking in front of me. While a blonde girl named Saber, who calls herself a servant, is silently following behind me. The hallway feels like it's a different dimension, but I can't stay a coward forever. I may still be in training, but I'm still a mage. So Sokka, who is apparently a fellow mage, is as bold and brass, so I have to hold my ground too or else I'll look stupid. So I can't really think of anything all that significant here. Like Saber, still following me. She keeps calling me master and we form some sort of contract, which probably makes her a kind of familiar. I've heard of familiar as an assistant mages use. Most mages transfer a part of their own body into something else and use it as their double. But typically they're small animals. Things like cats or dogs which is easier to control. Some mages do use humans, but to do that, they need an incredible amount of magical energy to constantly feed into the human to control them. Doing that require a mage to use over half their own magical energy just to sustain the, the familiar though. It's not, it's not exactly efficient. Familiars are, are supposed to be tools to help mages, which is why they usually use small animals who can be controlled with minimal effort and so aren't any burden. At least it's what I was taught. Is something wrong, Shiro? N no, nothing. Saber obviously looks human, and she is clearly superior to her master, that is me. I don't have enough magical energy to restrain someone, let alone the magic circuits to control familiars in the first place. Which means Saber is nothing like a familiar. She's called herself a servant. I don't know what she is, but that man named Lancer and the man in red Tosaka has in tow are all probably the same. Which means Tosaka can also be called a master. I've already seen enough of her magecraft skills. I'm less than a fledgling, but based on what I've seen, Tosaka is probably worth three mages. Though there's really not much sense comparing any mage to someone like me who can only do strengthening. What's clear is that Rin Tosaka is an exceptional mage. In spiritually strong lands, there are mage family lines which oversee a given area. The Emiya family came during Kiritsuku's generation, so our family is essentially outsiders. That's why I don't know Tosaka. That's why I didn't know Tosaka came from a family of mages, and I don't think Tosaka knew I came from one either. There are several mages in this town I don't even know about. If that Lancer guy is another mage's familiar too, that means I've gotten myself into the middle of some sort of some sort of fight between mages. Wow, this place is roomier than I expected, and the Japanese style of this room is unique. Oh, Emiya, is this a sitting room? I should really just stop and think for now. Now's the time to pay attention to what Tosaka has to say. I turn on the lights. It's already past one in the morning. Whoa, it's cold in here. Hey, the windows are all broken. It's not my fault. That Lancer guy attacked me. I didn't really have time to worry about windows. I see, so you were fighting that guy all by yourself until you summoned Saber? I'd say I was more of a punching bag than an opponent, really. Hmm. So you don't try to act all tough, I see. So you really are exactly as I thought. I don't know what's so amusing to her, I almost died. But Tosaka walks over to the broken window. Huh? Tosaka picks up a broken piece of glass. She stares at it for a second. All right, whatever that means. She cuts her fingertip and lets a single drop of blood fall on the window. What kind of magecraft is that? The shattered window begins to reassemble itself, returning to its original, undamaged state in a mere second. Yo, Tosaka, what did you just do? Just a little demonstration. 
It's not really a fit thank you for saving me back there, but I figure I should at least be, I should at least be gracious. Well, I'm sure you would have fixed it without my help since doing this is... I'm sure you would have fixed it without my help since doing this, since doing it this way. Oh my goodness, I'm illiterate. I'm sure you would have fixed it without my help since doing it this way is just a waste of magical energy. I know you could have replaced the windows, but I'd rather not talk in the cold. She says all this like it's a normal thing. Her skills are just beyond my comprehension. That's amazing, Tosaka. I can't do anything like that, so I appreciate you fixing it. What? You can't do this? No, that can't be right. Handling glass is one of the most basic skills. Fixing broken glass is like an entrance exam for my school. For any school. Is it now? I only know what my old man taught me, so I don't really know what you'd consider the basics. Huh? Tosaka stops abruptly. Crap, sounds like I said something I shouldn't have. Wait a minute. Are you telling me you're not even a full-fledged mage? With his own workshop to manage? Huh? I, I don't have a workshop. Well, actually, I have a shed I use for training, but... I think calling that a workshop would just make Tosaka angrier. Wait, don't tell me. Do you not know how to handle the five great elements? Or make a magical path? I just nod. Whoa, that's that's terrifying. Beautiful as she is, she gets intense when she gets goes quiet. So you're what? A complete amateur? Not exactly, no. Uh, I, I can at least do some strengthening magic? Strengthen? Kind of a useless skill if you ask me. So you don't know anything else. You call it useless, but it just saved my dang life. So Sokka just stares at me. Honestly, probably not. Her stare is so intense, I can't help but be vague in my answer. I just don't get how the likes of him wound up summoning Saber. She sighs, disappointed. I don't care much for that. It's not like I've been playing around here. Sure, I'm not a full-fledged mage, but that's not the issue here. Fine, what's done is done. So there's no sense complaining now. More importantly, I owe you and I need to pay you back. Tosaka takes a breath. So let's begin. Let me start by asking. Do you really not know anything about the position you're in here? I nod. I knew it. It was pretty obvious, but I wanted to check. It would be a waste of time if I explained all this to someone who knew everything. Like a bit of extra mental flab. That was a really weird way to put that. But I feel like if I get smart with her, she'll smack me. Let me get straight to the point, Emiya. You've been selected as a master. You see those sacred marks on your hand? They vary from person to person, but they're typically on the back of your hand or arm. And there should be three strokes of command spells engraved there. They're the mark that proves you're a master. Back of my hand. Oh, you mean this? Right, take good care of it. Since those are spells that control servants, they're called command spells. As long, as long as you have them, you can give orders to your servant. What do you mean, as long as I have them? Command spells are absolute orders. You might have already figured out that servants have free will, but those engravings in your hand overrule their will and force them to obey. There's no need to chant any kind of incantation. Deactivate when you think about using them. But each time you use one, you lose a stroke. So try to keep yourself to only using two. Anyway, just be careful. I'm pretty sure you'll die the moment you run out of command spells. Oh, hey, I'm gonna die. Yeah, huh? Masters defeating masters is pretty much how a Holy Grail war goes. And the master who defeats the other six is rewarded with the Holy Grail. What? Hold on a second. I don't understand what the hell Tosaka's saying. Masters defeating masters. And then they're granted the Holy Grail. As in the Holy Grail. Like, the Holy Grail. Still don't get it? Look, you've basically been dragged into a game. 
It's called the Holy Grail War and it's a battle between seven masters. It's a fight between mages that won't end until only one master remains. So Sokka talks about this as if it's the most normal thing in the world. Everything she says swirls around in my head. I was chosen as a master. So Sokka claims to be a master. Familiars called servants and the Holy Grail War. A battle to the death between seven Serp Mages. Okay, wait. What the hell are you talking about? I understand your confusion, but I'm only telling you the truth here. And I'm sure you understand deep down that you're in no position to run away from all this. Since you've already, since you've nearly been killed by a servant not once but twice. That, true, that Lancer guy did nearly kill me. Alright, you weren't almost killed, you were killed. I'm impressed you managed to come back from that. So Sokka's comment is the final nail in the coffin. She's absolutely right. That guy killed me, I died. There was no chance for me to talk him out of it, nor convince him otherwise. And I was, I was only there to die. That's why. Me backing out of this incomprehensible death match doesn't mean the others will do the same. Get it? Okay, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more. I don't know why there's a holy grail war in the- Oh. I don't know why there's a holy grail war in the- Oh wait, no, I, I'm right, I'm right. I don't know why there's a holy grail war in the first place. But what I do know is that every few decades, seven masters are selected and they are given servants. I'm also one of the chosen masters. That's why I formed a contact with the servant. And you formed one with Saber. Think of a servant as a familiar given to you by the Holy Grail to use to win the Holy Grail War. And as masters, we need to work with our servants to get rid of the other masters. Sosaka explains things matter-of-factly, but it feels totally unreal to me. But one thing she mentioned raised a question. Wait, you say Saber is a familiar, but I don't think she is. Familiars are usually cats or birds. Like, sure, there are some folk that use ghosts, but Saber has a physical body. Plus, she doesn't look like a familiar to me. I glance over at Saber. She's been quiet the whole time. Saber looks completely human to me. I don't know who she is, but she looks like looks to be about a girl the same age as me. A familiar, well... Servants may be in that category, but they're on a different level. See, that girl over there is a ghost liner, considered to be one of the strongest of all familiars. A ghost liner. So does that mean she really is a ghost? The spirit of a human, someone who died long ago. The residual thoughts of a person of exceptional ability, who remains in this world even after death. But that doesn't make sense. Ghosts don't possess this physical body. Ghosts can only hurt other ghosts. So how could I, who possess a physical body, be killed by a spirit? A ghost? Well, they are similar. But Saber will kill you if you keep thinking about thinking like that. Servants are incarnated... Servants are incarnated heroes of the past. So they're kind of a spirit well beyond humans. Huh? Incarnated heroes of the past? That's right. Whether they're from history or the modern world, these spirits of dead, legendary heroes are summoned and materialized here. Well, the role of the master is just to summon them. The Holy Grail War is what helps with the materialization. There's no way a mere mage could give spirits form, so we need to rely on a powerful artifact. Wait a minute. Are you saying that a hero from the past is... What? I look at Saber. She just keeps showing up like... So she's a hero of the past too? Well sure, nobody in the modern era would dress like her, but still. That's impossible. I've never heard of Magecraft like that. Of course not. This isn't Magecraft. Just think of it as a phenomenon brought by the Holy Grail. Otherwise, there's no way a soul could be recreated and actualized. Recreation of the soul. Does that mean these servants are different than phantoms? Nope. 
Once something, whether that be humans or an animal or even machinery, achieves something great, they are removed from the cycle of reincarnation and sublimated into something in it with a higher rank. Didn't you even learn about that? That's what heroic spirits are. Put another way, they're kind of like pseudo-gods who are all worshipped in some, some way or another. Seances, mediums, and other common magecraft that deals with spirits just borrow some of the spirits' power to perform miracles. But servants of heroic spirits themselves use as familiars. That's why they typically accompany you in spirit form, but materialize when it's time to fight if they're needed. So they can switch between spirit form and being corporal. I don't see your servant right now, so does that mean he's in spirit form? No, he's healing his room in my compound summoning circle right now. Remember? Saber wounded him earlier. If, I, if I'd have him withdraw even a heartbeat later, that blow would have annihilated him. Listen, only servants in spirit form can defeat other servants in spirit form. We can attack them when they're materialized, so we might be able to defeat them like that. But you've noticed, all the servants are monstrously strong, right? That's why we should leave the monsters to deal with the monsters while the masters hang back and serve as support. Tozaka's explanation ticks me off. I don't know what the other servants are like, but calling servants monsters doesn't feel like a fair description of Saber. <laughs> Glazing. But I don't blame you, she's bad. Anyway, humans who become masters use their summoned servant to defeat other masters. Did you at least get that much? In theory, yeah, but I'm still not convinced. First of all, what kind of sick mind thought to do this in the first place? That I don't know, nor could I answer even if I did. That sort of question would go to the person overseeing the Holy Grail War. The only thing I can tell you is that you really don't have any choice but to fight and to use your servant well, because they're extremely powerful. As Tosaka says that she turns to Saber. <laughs> Saber, after talking to Emiya, it looks like you're not in your complete form. You're incomplete since you were summoned by an apprentice mage with no idea what it means to be a master. Yes, you are correct that I am not in my complete form. Shiro does not have enough magical energy to fully materialize me, which means reverting to my spirit form and replenishing magical energy is, is difficult. I'm surprised. Your situation is worse than I expected, and I didn't think you'd be honest with me about it. I was actually kind of subtly trying to find out your weakness. I am reluctant to reveal my weakness to an enemy, but I also do not think I can deceive you. There's no point in hiding our situation from you. As such, we are better off if you know our circumstances than give Shiro a better understanding of the situation. Exactly. How insightful of you. Ugh. I still can't believe it. If only I was Saber's master, I would have been as good as one this thing. Osaka, are you saying I'm not fit to be your master? Obviously not, you freaking sham. Whoa. Anyone with the heart might have softened that blow a bit. What, do you have more questions? She doesn't even realize how hurtful her words are. My image of her is a perfect honor student as Sewell slowly crumbles. You say Sher was right about her, she's fiendishly relentless. Okay, now that we're at a good spot, let's get going. Tosaka announces this curtly, but it's kinda weird. What? Go where? I told you, we're going to see the guy who knows all about the game, the holy grail war you got roped into. You want to know why it happens, right? Man, can we do that tomorrow, bro? Like, I just got stabbed, my arm is broken, my back is broken, my knees have given out, I, I can barely do anything. Can I nap? Can I take a nap, please? Like, tomorrow is an off day. It's Saturday, tomorrow we're off Saturday. We're off tomorrow. Can I please take a nap? Can I please take a nap? Oh my goodness. We can do this tomorrow on Sunday. Can I please take a nap? Yeah, of course, but where are we going? It's already late, and if it's too far... It's fine. He's just in the next town over. We can get back home before dawn. 
Plus, tomorrow's Sunday, so it doesn't matter if we're up late. It's not the issue here. So much has happened today, and I'm utterly exhausted. I just want to rest and organize my thoughts. What, you don't want to go? Fine by me, but what about you, Saber? For some reason, Tosaka's asking for Saber's opinion. Hey, Saber's got nothing to do with this. Don't push her. Oh, already acting like a master, are we? You don't like me talking to Saber? Hey, that's not it. Just that if everything you said about this whole thing is true, then that would mean Saber's a hero from the past. That means she wouldn't know anything about the modern era. That's why... Shiro, you are incorrect. Servers can adapt to any time as long as they are summoned in a human world. So I am very aware of this age. You are? Really? Of course. This is not the first time I've been summoned to this age. What? Seriously? Seriously, what are the odds? Oh, Tosaka surprised too. That must mean what Saber said is at least somewhat unusual. Shiro, I agree with her. You lack, you lack knowledge as a master. As your contrasted servant, I would prefer that you get stronger. Saber silently stares at me. The look in her face tells me she's saying it's for my sake, not for her own safety. Fine, I guess I have to go, don't I? So where is this place, Osaka? We can still get back here from there, right? Of course we can. Our destination is Kodamine Church, just in the next town. That's where the sham priest, the one who oversees this whole battle lives. My goodness. All this reading is making my, 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 my. I almost said sore, almost said making my sore throat. Honestly, you know, eating dried chips don't help with that, but... So Sokka flashes a mischievous grin. It's the look of someone who enjoy, who's enjoying teasing me because I have no clue what's going on. At least it's what I think. I'm starting to believe Tosaka has a really nasty side. We walk through the town at night. It's one in the morning. There's nobody out at this hour. The houses are dark and the sleepy town is cast only in the streetlight's pale glow. Hey, Tosaka, are you planning on walking to the next town? Of course. Trains and buses aren't running right now. Sometimes the nighttime, sometimes the nighttime stroll is kind of nice. Okay, but I want to make sure. Do you know how long that walk will take? About an hour, right? If it gets too late, we could just grab a taxi on our way back. I don't have that kind of money, and my point is more about whether it's safe for a girl to walk around at this hour. You know it's been dangerous recently. I don't want to be responsible if something happens to you. Don't worry, no one's going to mess with us. You might have forgotten, but Saber here is really strong. Oh, now that she mentions it. If anyone picks a fight with Saber, they're dead for sure. Rin, what did Shiro mean when mean by what he said earlier? I did not quite understand. Uh, uh, he uh really misunderstood the situation. Also, he's an idiot. He was trying to say he swoop into our rescue if someone assaulted us. That cannot be right. Shiro is my master. Our worlds would be reversed if he did that. Yeah, he's probably not thinking about anything like that. Like he doesn't care what mages and servants are. Honestly, I'd like to see what's going on inside his head. Tosaka and Saber seem to be on good enough terms to chat now. Saber's been quiet ever since I stopped her from leaving the house as she was. She flatly refused to take off her armor, so I made her wear a raincoat. She's been quiet ever since. She a little salty. <laughs> now she's just following me and only speaks to Tosaka. <laughs> she mad that she she mad he got her wearing this trash fit. He's like, I'm fitted up. You're not even letting me flaunt. Come on, bro. 
My armor is sparkling. My blue is deep. And you're not letting me show it off. Go on somewhere. She mad. Huh? Where are you going, Emiya? That's the wrong way. We need to go to the bridge, right? Shortcut. I feel a little awkward walking right beside her, so I walk a little faster and took the side path. We enter along a we enter a park along the riverside. All we need to do is cross the bridge to reach Shinto. I didn't know there was a path here. I see. We just need to... What happened? We just need to head to the park, since the bridge is accessible from the park too. Maybe it's the park at night. Tosaka, she stands there, staring up at the bridge, looks prettier than when I see her at school. This is not good. Let's just go. We ain't come here to goof off, bruh. My back is broke. My arms are broke. My legs are spaghetti noodles. I need to get home. I remind Tosaka to hurry and start climbing the stairs. Once we've reached the road at the side of the bridge, it's just a straight shot to Shinto. There's nobody on the bridge. Not surprising since this bridge isn't exactly busy even during the day. People tend to take the bus or train to get to the next town, but the pedestrian bridge doesn't see much use. It's a pretty good distance, and the bridge itself seems a little unsteady, so people might worry it could collapse at any time. Probably why this isn't a very popular spot for dates, even though the location and ambiance are perfect. Oh, God, what is in your head, Shiro? Stop thinking about stupid crap. Zebra follows silently while Ren rocks beside me. I hurry across the bridge as fast as I can and try not to think too much about the two girls with me. Once we cross the bridge, Tosaka leads us to the suburbs. The office building near the station only come to mind when I think of Shinto but there's still a traditional landscape on the outskirts. The suburbs are especially prominent in that sense. There are gentle slopes and a hill that overlook the ocean. The further up the hill you go, the fewer buildings there are. And there's even a foreigner cemetery built along the hillside. The church is, the church is at the top of the hill. Have you ever been? Nope, never. Though I do know it, I do know it used to be used as an orphanage. I see. If this is your first time, you might want to brace yourself. The church's priest isn't exactly the easiest man to deal with. I look up and see a shadow that must be the building on top of the hill. A church atop a hill. I never imagined a circumstance like this is, is what would bring me to God's house. Man, ain't nothing godly about this place, bruh. I'll watch Phase Zero. I know, I know how wicked it is here. Whoa, this is amazing. The church is magnificent. The whole hilltop seems to be a church grounds, and I'm greeted by a huge source space the moment I reach the top of the hill. The church at the other side of the vast open space isn't all that big, but it seems to loom over everything, intimidating any visitors. Shiro, I will stay behind. Oh, why? We came all this way. I can't just leave you here. My purpose was not to visit the church, but to protect you along the way. If your destination is a church, then you will not stray far from it. So I will wait here for you to return. Saber is frank in her response. I can't see her budging at this point, so I decide to respect her decision. Alright, then I'll be back. Yes. And do not let your guard down, no matter who you are dealing with, Master. The chapel is large and majestic. It must see many visitors during the day, based on the number of pews in the chapel. The priest must have incredible authority if he's able, if he's responsible for a church as grand as this one. Tosuka, what kind of man is the priest here? It's kind of hard to explain. I've known him for over a decade now, but I still can't figure him out. Known him for over a decade, that's a long time to know someone. You two related to something? No, but he's my guardian. On top of that, as a disciple, he's my senior and my second mentor. Senior disciple? Senior disciple? As a mage? Yeah. 
Why is it such a surprise? He's a priest, right? Aren't priests forbidden from using magecraft? Mages and churches have never mixed well. Mages belong to a large organization called the Mages Association. But there's also a hidden group operating in the shadow of, mo of the most widespread religion. Not one normal people would ever hear about or want to get involved with known as the Holy Church. The two have nothing in common. They may have a sort of alliance, but they're constantly trying to kill each other given half a chance. The church loathes heretics. They're out to eliminate anything inhuman in the world, including users of magecraft. Good. I don't. Un I never understand. Like any time you go to an anime, or like anything anime inspired, and like any like fantasy or whatever, like you know fantasy anime, right? And you have a church in there. There are always some like pure is it it's a puritan that's the word right puritan i think it's puritan always like puritans that only want humans to exist nothing else can live nobody that's no nobody with power should ever exist we gotta kill them like dang they always they, they like crusaders it's like they do not know how churches actually work they don't know bro it's so crazy to me how to eliminate anything in human in the world in the church's eyes, only saints are permitted to perform miracles. All other human miracles are heresy. There are no exceptions, even for those within the church. The higher the position one is within the church, the more they are forbidden from the impurity of magecraft. It goes without saying that the more blessings one or someone receives from God, especially someone who is in charge of a church like this, the further the distance they should take from magecraft. Actually, I didn't know the priest here was on our side. Yeah? He's the one supervising the Holy Grail War, so he's definitely an agent. Well, whether he's actually received any blessings from God is an open question. So Sokka's footsteps echo as she walks towards the altar. I'm not sure whether you're supposed to be walking around here without a priest, but it is pretty late. The priest wouldn't be in a chapel at this hour. I guess he'd be in the his private room out back. Huh, so what's the priest's name? I think you said Kotomine or something earlier? His name is Kede Kotomine. He's my father's disciple and unfortunately I've known him for over 10 years. If I had a choice, I'd rather not have ever met him. I assure you the feeling is mutual. I never wish for a pupil who refuses to respect her mentor. Tap tap, I hear footsteps. A man slowly emerges from the far side of the altar. We must have noticed when we entered the chapel. I remember you. I remember you. I ain't gonna say what all you did. If I'm being real, I don't remember all what he did. I don't remember much of anything that he did. All I remember is that I didn't like him. <laughs> I remember I did not like him. But he was cold though. I'm not gonna see her act like he wasn't cold. He was cold, but I didn't like him. I've been calling you, Rain, but you haven't answered. Now you bring me a strange guest. So he's the seventh Rain. Uh-uh, why you so tall? Back up! Right, he's a mage, apparently, but he's a complete amateur. It's frustrating as hell. And as the rules say to report here when someone becomes a master, right? It's a stupid rule your group made up, but I figured I'd follow it this time. How commendable of you. Well then, I must thank this young man. The priest slowly looks me over. I unconsciously step back. I'm not afraid, and I don't sense any hostility from this priest. But the way he carries himself, he just gives off this indescribable aura of intimidation. My name is Kirei Kodamine, and I have been entrusted to run this church. What is your name, Seventh Master? It is Shiro Emiya, but I don't remember signing up to be a master. I brace myself, glaring at the priest, so as not to buckle under the intimidating presence. Shiro Emiya. Huh? That intimidating aura grows chilly. The priest smiles as if pleased. That smile of his. 
I can't explain it. It makes me... I must thank you, Emiya. You have brought Rin here. If it wasn't for you, she would have never set foot in this church. The priest makes his way to the altar. Tosak, on the other hand, just looks bored as she moves away from the altar and comes to stand next to me. Then let us begin, Shiro Emiya. You are Saber's master, correct? Not entirely true. I did form a contract with Saber, but I have no idea what the hell Masters and a Holy Grail Wars are. Their proper mages are the only ones who can be masters, and you should pick a different one. I see. This is a pity. Does he really know nothing, Ren? I told you he's a complete novice. You'll need to teach him from the ground up. You're good at pushing people like that, aren't you? So Sokka practically pawns me off at the, pawns me off on the priest still looking bored. Oh, I see. So that's your plan. Very well. This is the first time you have depended on me for anything. It seems I cannot thank Shiro Emiya enough for bringing me this opportunity. The more I hear them talk, the more uneasy I get. First, let me address some of your misconceptions. Listen to me, Shiro Emiya. The role of master isn't something you can simply pass on to someone else. Nor is it something like that. After you have been chosen, you can simply quit. You can't pass it on? Look, I don't know, man. I vaguely remember something like that maybe happening in Fate Zero. So, like, bro might be lying to me right now. Unless he just doesn't know. Once command spells are engraved on one's hand, there is no means by which they can reassign from being a master, regardless of who they might be. I can't quit. Why not? Command spells are sacred marks. They are a trial placed upon masters. You can't simply forfeit because it's inconvenient. You will not be released from that pain until the Holy Grail is obtained. If you want to resign from being a master, the only thing you can do is obtain the Holy Grail and have your wish granted. Do this and everything can go back to normal for you, Shiro Emiya. Anything you desire, even ridding yourself of the impure mud within you is possible. Why? Even starting over entirely is possible. And so you should desire it. Should the time come, you will be grateful for your luck in being chosen as a master. If you wish to be rid of those unseen burn scars you have, you simply have to accept that sacred mark. I feel faint. The priest's words don't make any sense. The more I listen, the more I'm confused. Yet his words permeate in my mind, staining me like blood. Kire, don't be so obtuse. I just asked you to explain the rules to him. I never asked you to open up old wounds. Her voice interrupts the priest's words. Tosaka! My confused mind snaps back. Ah. I believe nothing else would sink in for someone like him. So I thought I would at least break down his morality while he was still confused. Well, I suppose kindness isn't always entirely for the benefit of the recipient. I must admit, I did enjoy that quite a lot. What? Does helping him do you any good? Of course. Helping people means saving yourself in the end. I suppose there's not much sense in me lecturing you about that, though. Let me return to the matter at hand, Shiro Emiya. You find yourself involved in what is known as the Holy Grail War. It is a battle waged using seven servants commanded by seven, seven masters. I hope Rin would have at least told you that. Yeah, she did. She told me about the whole ridiculous thing where seven masters fight to the death. Correct. But we are not indulging in such cruelty for entertainment. It is a ritual to determine who is worthy of obtaining the Holy Grail. For a powerful item as that, rigorous trials must be conducted to determine who should possess it. The hell with trials. I bet this priest doesn't think of the Holy Grail War as a trial at all. Wait, you keep saying Holy Grail, what even is that? 
You don't mean the actual Holy Grail, right? The Holy Grail. A goblet set to have received the blood of a saint. It's considered to be one of the most, one of the greatest sacred relics of all time. And it's said to perform a variety of miracles. I was about to say, like, wasn't the Holy Grail the cup Jesus drank out of? I knew it was something I couldn't remember, but I was like, I wanted to say that and it looked stupid though. But I was like, isn't that the cup he drank out of? One of the most widely held beliefs is that whoever holds the Holy Grail can possess the entire world. But that seems kind of unlikely since the Holy Grail itself probably doesn't even exist. I don't know about that. Stories of a Holy Grail that can grant any wish appear in numerous myths and legends around the world. But that's about it. A mythical power that none claim has ever actually existed or been replicated. That is the Holy Grail. So what is it, Kirei Kodamine? Is the Holy Grail you speak of really the Holy Grail? Of course it is. The Holy Grail that appears in this town is real. If you want proof, the appearance of the servants themselves is a miracle, isn't it? Summoning heroic spirits from the past and utilizing them? It is a miracle close enough to the resurrection of the dead that it could be considered re that it could be that it could be the, that it could, summoning heroic spirits from the past and utilizing them. It is a miracle close enough to be close enough to the resurrection of the dead that it could be considered magic. A holy grail of such power must in turn grant its owner limitless power. When considering the truth of how powerful it is, its authenticity hardly matters. So what he's saying. That as long as the object possesses power that surpasses the real thing, it doesn't matter whether it's real or fake. Fine, let's assume it really is a holy grail. Then why would something like a holy grail war need to happen? If the holy grail exists, we shouldn't be killing each other over it. Something so amazing should be shared. A reasonable opinion, however not an opinion we have the luxury of. Only one can obtain the holy grail. We cannot ch ourselves choose who. That is for the Grail to decide. The selection of the seven masters and the summoning of seven servants are all determined by the Holy Grail itself. I mentioned that this was a ritual. The Holy Grail selects those who are worthy of possessing it, and then each against the other to select, and then each against the other to select the soul bearer. That is what a Holy Grail War is, a sort of necromantic ritual where those chosen by the Holy Grail fight to the death to obtain it. He's so matter-of-fact about it all. I have no response, so I just stare at my left hand. There's an inscription on my hand, a mark these two call the command spell. As long as I have this mark, I'm told I can't quit being a master. So does it make sense. Just because only one person can be selected, there's no reason for all the other masters to die. Wait a minute, you don't have to actually kill them, Emiya. The ritual doesn't require you to kill the masters. Huh? But you said it's a battle to the death, even Kodamine said that. You do kill each other. Kire, shut up! Okay, so the Holy Grail is here in spirit form. It's not tangible as an object. It needs to be summoned in a special ritual, kind of like a seance. Summoning it can be done by just us mages, but as long as it's in spirit form, we can't touch it. Do you understand what that means? I do. Only spirit forms can touch other spirit forms. Oh, so that's why you need servants. Exactly. To put it in simple terms, the goal of the Holy Grail War is for you to eliminate all the other servants other than your own. There's no rule that you have to kill the masters. Why didn't they tell me that earlier? Honestly, Tosaka and that priest both are pretty wicked. But that's a relief. That means Tosaka won't have to die, even if I do join the Holy Grail War. I suppose that's one way to look about it. So let me ask you, Shiro Emiya. Do you think you can beat your own servant? Huh? Defeat Saber? Of course not. Besides, Magecraft is useless against her and she's insanely strong with her sword. Then one more question for you. 
though it may be a trifling one. Do you think yourself superior to your servant? What? Why the hell is he asking that? I can't beat Saber, so there's no way I'm better than her. My answer to both of those questions is that I'm weaker than my servant. Oh. Now you get it. Servants have enough trouble defeating other servants. So what could you do? It's simple, really. A servant cannot exist without their master. No matter how powerful the servant, they will disappear once their master is killed. Which means... Now I get it. Nobody would make things harder for themselves. If someone wanted to make sure they won, killing the master would be the much easier path. Yeah, I get it now. It's easier to defeat the master than the servant. Let me ask you this then. If the servant is defeated first, is their master no longer a master? If servants are the only ones who can touch the Holy Grail, then the master who lost their servant becomes obsolete, right? No. As long as the command spell remains, they still have the right to they have still have the right to remain a master. A master is simply a maze who can make a contract with a servant. So long as they have a command spell, they can form contracts with, with as many servants as they want. A servant who loses their master does not disappear immediately. They can remain in this world until they run out of magical energy. Servants who lose their masters and masters who lose their servants can forge a new contract together and return to the battle. Which is why masters seek to kill other masters. Allowing the others to live may pose a greater risk later on. Then what if you use up your command spells? That means you can't form another contract with another servant, and the servant who gets freed will pair up with another master. Wait, that's... You are correct. If you use up all your command spells, you will be freed from your duties as master. Although, it's hard to believe any mage would waste their command spells, since each can conform extremely powerful magecraft. And if there were to be such a master, they would be a fool as well as a coward. The priest laughs as if he can see right through me. This is starting to get to me. The priest's tone is provoking. Do you understand now? This here in death the this here in death the lesson. Now let us return to where we began, Shiro Emiya. You mentioned that you had no intention of becoming a master. Do you still feel that way? If you want to forfeit your position as a master, that is fine too. As you have just pointed out, you can use your command spells to terminate your contract with Saber. Should you do so, I will guarantee your safety until the Holy Grail War ends. Wait, hold on a minute, why the hell would you need to guarantee my safety? I can protect myself. I honestly do not have the time to look after you, but those are the rules. I have been assigned to oversee this repeating Holy Grail War. Thus, I must ensure the sacrifices made through the Holy during the Holy Grail War be kept to a minimum. Protecting the safety of mages who are no longer masters is one of my most important responsibilities as the Overseer. You say repeating Holy Grail War? Hold on a minute. It repeats? Does that mean a battle like this happened before? What do you mean? Are you saying this isn't the first Holy Grail War? Of course not. Do you think an overseer would have been dispatched if this were the first time? This church is a special agency responsible for collecting relics. Our organization's original goal is to investigate and recover the true cross. But here our duty is to assess the Holy Grail. Our job is to investigate the several, the 726th Holy Grail that was detected in the Far East and recover it, if it is indeed real. And if that is not real, we were repudiated. 726? Are there really that many Holy Grails? Who knows? At the very least, it means there are that many objects thought to be Holy Grails. And one of those is the Holy Grail observed in this town, which triggered a Holy Grail war. 
According to extant records, the first battle occurred about 200 years ago. Since then, masses have fought over every 50 years or so. This will be the fifth Holy Grail War. The last one happened about 10 years ago, so this is the shortest cycle yet. Wha Are you insane? You guys have done this thing four times already? I quite agree. As you pointed out, this has been repeated many times. That's right. In the past, this repeated Holy Grail wars have been exceedingly fierce. Masters were driven by their desires as they killed each other indiscriminately, forgetting their disciplines as mages. You may already know this, but the biggest sin to commit as a mage is practicing mage trap within normal society. Mages must never reveal their identities to others. But the masters of the past broke that law. The Mages Association finally dispatched an overseer to crack down on masters like them. But that system was only put in place by the time of the Holy Third Holy Grail War. And that first overseer was my father. Does that make sense now, my boy? Yeah, I get that an overseer is needed. But based on what you just said, this Holy Grail War is fundamentally a bad thing, right? In what way is it fundamentally bad? The previous masters willingly broke the laws of mages, right? Then let's say the Holy Grail is real. real. What if whoever survives and wins it, wins is selfish and uses the Holy Grail for their own selfish purposes? Wouldn't it be pretty bad if the Holy Grail went to someone who, had, who has no problem killing people? The association's job is to supervise mages. Shouldn't you be the one punishing those types of folks? I'm hoping to finally confuse him with this question. But as I figure, Kodamine just laughs condescendingly. Of course not. All mages are motivated by their self-interest. I am only responsible for managing the rules of the Holy Grail War. I do not care what happens afterwards. The association does not intervene, no matter what sort of person obtains the Holy Grail. But that's absurd. What if the Holy Grail is obtained by a master who's absolutely the worst? That would be bad. But, if, but it is out of our control. The Holy Grail is the one that chooses its master. We do not have the power to stop a master who has been chosen by the Holy Grail. You see, it is a chalice capable of granting any desire. Whoever obtains it will be able to do as they please, I'm sure. But if that idea troubles you, then your path is clear. Survive and win. During Doing this thing yourself would be the approach most certain to work, as opposed to relying on others, correct? Kodamine is clearly trying to suppress his laughter. It's like he's enjoying watching my awkward resistance to becoming a master. What's wrong, my boy? I thought that was a rather good idea. Care to accept it? It's none of your business. First of all, I have no reason to fight. I'm not interested in the Holy Grail, nor do I feel like a master even if you tell me otherwise. So do you not care what the winner of the Holy Grail does with it? Even if it may lead to a great catastrophe? Well that... I can't argue. This guy is just so hard to deal with. He doesn't care about my feelings, and he's, he's relentless with the information he pushes on me. If you have no reason to fight, that is fine too. That must mean you do not care about what happened 10 years ago. 10 years ago? That's right. Towards the end of the previous Holy Grail War, an unworthy master touched the Holy Grail. I do not know what the master desired. All we know is that the disaster that followed... For a second... The image of that hell flashes before my eyes. Wait, don't tell me that. That's right. It is a catastrophe everyone in this town knows very well. 500 people were killed or wounded. 134 buildings burned to the ground. That fire, which is still unexplained to this day, was a consequence of the Holy Grail War. Feel sick. My vision blurs. 
I lose my focus and I can't concentrate. My legs are about to buckle. Before that can happen, I plant my feet. I grit my teeth and maintain my composure. Raw, seething anger is the only thing holding my nausea at bay. Emiya, what's wrong? You're white as a sheet. I know that wasn't a pleasant topic to bring up, but come on, why don't you rest a bit? I must have really looked pale. I know it's rare for someone like Tosaka to be concerned about the likes of me. Don't worry. I feel better after seeing you looking at me so weird. Hey, what's that supposed to mean? Nothing. Exactly what I said, so don't worry about it. I guess that's okay. Hey, that's even worse, you blockhead! The school's honor student, Rain Tosaka, smacks me upside the head. And just like that, my nausea and anger disappear. Uh, thanks, she really did me a favor, so don't beat me up too much, Tosaka. There's still a few things I have to ask. There's nothing I want you to ask. Can I end this episode already? <laughs> Something in her expression suggests she thinks she hasn't hit me enough, but she lets me continue anyway. Oh, you still have questions? By all means, out with it. I'm sure he knows exactly what I want to ask, but he urges me on anyway. Fine by me. I'm not letting him get the better of me. Let me ask you this. You said that this is the fifth Holy Grail War. So has anyone ever obtained the Holy Grail? Of course. Not every war ends with everyone dead. Then, don't jump to conclusions. Obtaining it is the easy part. After all, this church actually manages and is in possession of the Holy Grail. If you're wondering whether someone has touched it. I'll have you know the day I I'll have you know I touch it every day. The Holy Grail is here in the church. Well, it's just a vessel. It's quite empty. As Rin said earlier, the Holy Grail is in a spirit form. The church is safekeeping a well-made replica of the Holy Grail. We use it as a catalyst to draw the real Holy Grail out and create the wish-granting device it becomes. I suppose it is similar to a master... Oh, hold on. Something messed up. To a master and servant relationship. And yes, there was indeed a man who obtained the Holy Grail, which temporarily turned real. Hold on. So the Holy Grail was real? Okay, what happened to that guy who obtained it? Nothing. The Holy Grail never reached its full complete form because the foolish man let his sentiments get the better of him. What? I don't know what happened to his overbearing attitude from a moment before, but the priest suddenly looks of all things regretful. What do you mean? Didn't the Holy Grail appear? Manifesting the Holy Grail is easy. Seven servants appear, and then some time later, the Holy Grail does as well. As Rin pointed out, there's no real need to kill other masters. But that's not enough to complete the Holy Grail. A Grail selects a worthy owner. For that reason, a man who had avoided the battle was unable to obtain the Holy Grail. It just means that... It just means it's useless to obtain the Holy Grail without settling things with the other masters. The master who first got their hands on the Holy Grail during the last war was just a wuss. They didn't want to fight other masters that just ran away from the Holy Grail. Osaka almost spits the words, then goes back to averting her eyes from Kodamine. You're kidding. Does that mean Kodamine was one of the masters from the previous war? And even though he obtained the Holy Grail, he dropped out because he refused to fight? You didn't fight. I did, halfway. But I made a bad decision. Consequently, I only obtained an empty Holy Grail. I suppose that must have been my limit anyway. 
The rest of the matches were all martialistly strong, terrifying even. I immediately lost my servant and I was taken under my father's protection. In retrospect, the son of the overseer shouldn't have become a master in the first place. It led to my father's death. After all, I assumed his role as overseer and I've been protecting the Holy Grail at this church. Kodamine turns his head back to me as he speaks. There's reverence in his voice and I see the devotion in his eyes before he turns. We have nothing further to discuss. Those, quali those qualities to obtain the Holy Grail, those qualified to obtain the Holy Grail are masters who have servants. The moment there is only one of the the moment there is only one of the seven of you standing, the Holy Grail shall manifest before you. So tell me, will you join this Holy Grail war? The priest looks straight down at me, demanding my final decision. I'm at a loss for words. Earlier, I had no reason to fight. Now I have a reason and the will to fight. Can I truly say as much? Are you still unsure? Listen, you do not become a master just by saying it's what you want. Rin has been training as a mage for many years, but that never meant she was guaranteed to be a master. The only thing you can decide beforehand is whether you to prepare yourself to be a master or not. Only mages can be selected to be masters. If you are a mage, you should have already been prepared. However, if you are still lacking resolve, there is nothing to be done. But that makes both you and your mentor failures. A mage like you would only be a nuisance in battle. So you might as well get rid of your command spells right here, right now. He was like, uh-uh, you are not about to talk to the GOAT, Kirisugu, like he's some type of failure. You know, but you ain't about to be talking about him like that. That's the GOAT. He doesn't need to say anything else. I. Oh. Save. I mean, it's pretty obvious what I'm going to do. I'm going to fight. I'm not going to run away. To be honest, all this Holy Grail worn master stuff doesn't seem real to me. If my only choices are to fight or run, I'll never run away. Even the priest told me that I should be prepared if I'm a mage. That's why I need to decide. Shiro Emiya is a mage, even if not yet a full-fledged one. I've always admired Kiritsugu Emiya, and I decided to follow in his footsteps to become a champion of justice, so I need to... I'll fight as a master. You're telling me that the cause of the fire 10 years ago was the Holy Grail War. Then I can't let something like that happen again. The priest gives me a satisfied smile as if he likes my answer. I take a deep breath, deep breath. I'm done wavering. A man has said he's going to fight. The only thing to do now is to move forward, head held high so I can live up to that. Then I shall acknowledge you as Saber's master. And as of this moment, the Holy Grail War has been accepted. From here on until only one master remains, Magecraft battles are permitted. Each participant shall put their full efforts into the competition in accordance with their own principles. The priest's voice echoes heavily through the chapel. The declaration is utterly meaningless. Only Tosaka and I are here to mean it anyway. Here to he only here to hear it anyway. He just rang a metaphorical bell to kick things off as a formality, I guess. Then that's that. But before you go home, care to answer a question, Kire? I don't mind. It's maybe the final one, so I'll try to answer as much as I can. Then no holds barred. Since you're the overseer, you probably have information on all the other masters. I'm following the association's rules, so you should be able to disclose that to me. Well, I'm not sure what to do. I really do want to tell you, but I actually do not know the details. What I do know is that there aren't many legitimate mages this time around. As in the case with Shiro Emiya, I only know two masters, or rather, with the inclusion of Shiro Emiya, I know three. Is that so? But you at least know the order the servants were summoned in. 
You are the overseer. Well, the first was Berserker. The second was Caster. There was not much difference after that. Archer was summoned a few days back, while Summon was summoned a, while Saber was summoned a few hours ago. I see. Then that means... It means the Holy Grail War has officially started. Bryn, until the Holy Grail War concludes, you are not permitted to set foot inside this church. The only time you will be allowed in, you will be allowed will be... If I lost my servant and asked for sacred san sanctuary, right? Otherwise, we'll get penalized if we seek for your help. Correct. You are likely to win, but the church will not simply ignore any marks against you. They will not hesitate to take the Holy Grail from you for any uh, for, for whatever asinine reason. That would be the worst possible outcome for me. You're such a freaking fraud of a priest. A man from the church siding with the mage's association. I simply serve God. I do not serve the church. Listen to you. This is why you're a fraud. That's valid, though. You serve, the, you serve God. So Sokka turns her back on the priest. Without saying goodbye, she makes her way toward the exit. Hey, is that okay to do, Tosaka? Isn't he your senior? Shouldn't you... Shouldn't she have a little more to say than that? It's fine. I'm actually relieved that I can sever ties with him once and for all. You should get out of here too. You don't have any more business here. Tosaka cuts through the chapel without stopping and leaves the church. I sigh and follow Tosaka. But then... I sense something and turn around. I don't know when he caught up, but the priest is right behind me looking down at me. Hey, bro, you got something to say to me? I'm talking big, but I take a step back. The priest scares the hell out of me. I don't know what it is. He's, maybe he just rubs me the wrong way. Whatever it is, I can't make myself like him. I'm going home if you ain't got nothing. I head to the exit trying to escape his stare. But at that moment... Rejoice, my boy. Your wish will finally come true. The priest speaks like he's some kind of divine oracle. Those words... Aren't they a reflection of my true feelings? Shiro Emiya's true intentions that I wasn't even aware of? What are you saying? I'm sure you know already. Without an evil to fight, your, your wish will never be granted. Even if you don't want to admit it, a hero of justice requires a villain to defeat. Everything around me seems to go dark. The priest says, Shiro Emiya's greatest wish and his ugliest wish are two sides of the same coin. That's right, my wish to protect something means that I'm also wishing for something to protect people from. But I would never wish for something like that. I don't even remember desiring that. A wish so unstable. Just means that I'm aspiring, that just means what I'm aspiring to is contradictory. Yet the priests bring that up. As if to say, good thing you have an enemy now. You needn't sugarcoat it. Your conflict is only natural for a human being. I try to shake off the priest's words and head outside. Farewell, Shiro Emiya. This will be my final warning. Be careful on your way home. The world as you know it is about to change. You will kill or be killed, for you are a master now. Can we sleep now? Can we... Like, my, my legs are spaghetti noodles, my arms are broken, my back is fractured, I'm bleeding. I would really like to take a nap. As soon as I leave, the weight on my shoulder seems to lift. Hi, Saber. And maybe because I'm away from the priest. But it might also be because I, can, I see Tosaka, conspicuous in her uniform, and the blonde girl in a raincoat. The slightly unmatched sight of those two standing together relieves whatever pressure I felt. Saber is still silent. She looks at me and seems to know what I wants to know what I decided. 
Let's go. We're going in the same direction until we meet until we reach town. So Sokka starts walking, her pace brisk. Saber and I follow suit, and the three of us leave the church grounds. We walk down the hill. We hadn't talked much on the way here, but there's less even less conversation on the way back. Even someone as dull as me knows why. After our visit, visit to, the, to the church, I accept my position as a master. That must be why Tosaka is keeping her distance. I get it. But I don't like the idea of seeing Tosaka in that light. Tosaka, how's your servant? Oh, if you're wondering, Archer's fine. The injury he sustained from Saber won't be easy to heal, so he won't materialize for a while, though. Does that mean he isn't by your side? Nope, he's cooped up in my house. He'd be at a disadvantage if he was ambushed by other servants. So I'm having him prepare to fight by recuperating somewhere safe. I see. Unlike my house, I'm sure Tosaka's house is uh, well fortified against enemies. A mage's home is like a fortress. There's not much chance of defeating them there. Which means enemies tend not to try attacking them at home. A bounded field around our house just notifies of his intruders, but even having that makes a big difference. By the way, Tosaka, the priest mentioned he was the overseer of the Holy Grail War. Does that mean he knows who your servant is? He shouldn't know. I've never told him. I see. You guys seem to get along, so I thought you had. Emiya. I'm going to give you a little advice. Never tell anyone your servant's identity. No matter how much you trust the other person, you should keep quiet. Otherwise, you'll end up dropping out early. Huh? What do you mean, Saber's identity? I'm talking about which hero your servant is. No matter how strong they are, revealing their strength to others will just lead to a knife in the back. Just ask Saber her true name later. You'll understand when you learn about her. Actually, it might be better if she doesn't tell you because you're, you know, kind of freaking stupid. Why not? You can't keep secrets. You might have the best chance at keeping the secret if you just don't know. Hey, who do you think I am? I can at least follow a strategy like that. Are you sure? Does that mean you're still something you're hiding from me? Something I'm hiding from you. Well, I feel a hot blush in my cheeks as she looks at me. I shouldn't feel guilty, but I wonder if secretly idolizing her even counts in this context. See? I don't know what it is, but your face tells me you're hiding something. And that's why you're not fit for this. There's plenty of other good things about you, so stop thinking of silly tactics like these. Uh, yeah. Then what about you? If you're a mom about your servant and if to that priest, does that mean you don't trust him? Kire, of course not. I'm not naive enough to trust him. He's a big hypocrite who switched sides from the church to the main association. Yet he still has a seat at the church. He'd spill it to the other masters the second he felt like it. Osaka huffs, obviously annoyed. I guess Osaka really doesn't trust that priest. I'm a little relieved, but at the same time, her tone of voice also conveys a sort of closeness with the priest. We cross the bridge. There's nothing else to talk about. Our frosty white breath hangs in the winter air. The faint sound of flowing water bubbles up from beneath the bridge while we walk in the streetlight's illumination. All those small details etch themselves onto my memory. Oddly, I don't think to look at Tosaka's face. Feels more like a rarity to be walking beside her like this than it does to see her face. Me, Tosaka, and the girl called Saber about whom I know nothing. The three of us, without doing anything in particular, walk back to our homes. We reach the intersection. It's where we have to separate as our homes are in opposite directions. We should split up here. I've done my duty and things would get complicated if we stuck together any longer. We should part ways amicably, and tomorrow we'll become enemies. I think she's trying to bring closure to our ambiguous relationship. Osaka starts talking but suddenly cuts off. 
Then I realized something. She didn't explain the rules to me out of obligation. She was only trying to help me as I knew absolutely nothing to make things fair for me. And that's why the moment things have been explained, everything goes back to normal. All that's left is for us to fight each other as masters. But that would make her last words to me strange. Osaka must have meant it would be hard to fight if she feels empathy for me. For Osaka, everything that happened tonight was unnecessary. Things would get complicated if we stuck together any longer. That's how she feels. She shouldn't have gotten involved with me in the first place. She's smart enough to know that. But she helped me. Even knowing it wouldn't benefit her in any way. That's how I know she had no ulterior motive for doing what she did tonight. She did it purely out of the kindness of her heart. Osaka's totally different than she usually is at school. She's harsh and unfriendly at school, and that's putting it mildly. But seeing her right now, I want to ask why the hell she acts out the way she does at school. Honestly, the difference is on the level of a fraud. But either way, Rento Osaka is exactly what everyone thinks she is. You know? You're a good person, Tosaka. Huh? Where'd that come from? Hey, Flight only won't make me go easy on you. I know that. She had to tell me it would be a pain to be empathetic because she isn't someone going to go easy on I know. But I would rather not be enemies with you because I like people like you. Hold on, spit that game. Spit that game. Hold on, spit that game. I heard Tosaka's house is in a residential district with all the western houses in the opposite direction of my house. She took care of me up until now, so I'd like to walk her home. Anyway, don't forget to run to that church the moment your servant is killed. You'll at least live if you do that. I'm not sure about that, but I'll still take your advice. Anyway, I don't think that'll happen, since I'm most likely to die before Saber. I've calmly assessed the situation. So Sokka's reaction is once again puzzling. After that weary sigh, she glances at Saber. Fine. I won't warn you anymore. At this point, I would really like to be an... I would really like... At this point, I would... <laughs> Fine. I won't warn you anymore. At this point, it would really just be an act of empathy. Just be careful. Saber may be strong, but it's all over for you. The master wind up dead. She turns around and starts walking. And yet, she stops dead on the track as if she's seen a ghost. The moment I call out to her, a stinking pain shoots through my left hand. Okay, I think I actually, I think I remember this episode. Hold on, let me see if I, let me see if what's about to happen if, if I know what's about to happen. I'ma wait. And if what I think is about to happen happens, I'm then I'll, hold on, I'ma know. <laughs> I know it! Yo, okay, this is where I left off. This is where I left off when I was watching the anime. Are you two done chatting? A young voice echoes in the night. The sing-song tone comes unmistakably from a young girl. My eyes are drawn to the top of the hill. I had to notice the clouds parting. Now the brilliant moon illuminates the sky. And there... Is that you, Jiro Hanma? A shadow looms. It's a, strange, it's a strange shape that seems out of place in the darkened town. I'm not familiar with the word Tosaka whispers. I don't even need to ask. It's definitely a servant. Gives off an overwhelming aura of death that surpasses even the fire from 10 years ago. Good evening, brother. This is the second time we've met. The girl smiles. Her innocence sends a chill up my spine. No, the chill goes deeper than that. It's not just my body, even my mind freezes. That thing is a monster. I'm not even looking into its eyes, but its intimidating presence paralyzes me. My instincts tell me I'm dead the instant I move. It feels like someone is pressing a knife against my exposed stomach. Uh-uh! 
Crap, he's definitely in a different league. Well, all I managed to do is stand there, paralyzed. So Sokka's composed enough to brace himself. Brace herself. Even that seems futile. I can only see her back, but I still sense her despair. Oh, is your servant resting? That's no fun. I thought I would get rid of two at once. The young girl seems displeased as she stands at the top of the at the top of the hill looking down on us. This is even worse. The girl knows that Tosaka's servant is not here. And then the girl bows gracefully, which seems wildly out of place given the current mood. Right, very nice to meet you, Ren. My name is Ilya. Perhaps you might net Perhaps you might recognize the name as Iliasville von Eis e Einsburn better. So Sokka trembles lightly, seeming to recognize the name. The girl smiles, seemingly delighted by Tosaka's reaction. Then here we go! Kill them, Berserker! In a sing-song voice, the girl orders this mo the monstrosity behind her. Yo! The giant jumps in a single leap. This berserker sails all the way from the top of the hill to its bottom where we stand. Hold on. Saber surges forward, her raincoat fluttering off her shoulders, blocking my view for a moment. <laughs> Saber runs towards where Berserker is about to land. Berserker lands, kicking up a small torrent of air in its wake. The two meet almost simultaneously. The very air shakes. Saber stops Berserker's rock-like sword with her invisible sword. Saber's mouth twists as it strains. And then... Berserker's giant sword moves in a flash, creating a whirlwind. Thunder. The clash of swords almost tearing the air into Saber's defeat. I hear something skidding. Saber blocks Berserker's giant sword with her own, but the impact pushes her backwards. Saber buckles. The copper-skinned servant follows her. The monster swings its sword again and again, as if it knows how to as if it knows how to do nothing else. Saber continues to block with her sword, unable to dodge the strikes. Saber's sword is being invisible doesn't matter. She needs to put all her strength into blocking his attacks or she's dead for sure. Saber's left with no choice but to remain on the defensive. The only chance Saber has of winning is to find an opportunity to strike between Berserker's attacks. And yet, that's only if Berserker leaves her an opening. His massive black rock sword moves like a raging storm. He is enormous. Despite his size and unwieldy weapon, Berserker is faster than Saber. His unrelenting attacks just smash whatever is in his way. That's all. But it's enough to be effective. As long as he retains his overwhelming speed and power, he doesn't really need technique. Humans devise techniques to compensate for their own weakness. That giant, that monster, he has no weakness. Run! It's the only thing I can manage to say. My body is completely frozen. That thing cannot be beaten. Saber's going to die. That's why she needs to run. It'd be easy if it was if it was just here her that needed to flee. Of course she knows that perfectly well. Oh, that's not good. My body may be paralyzed, but my mind is still working. The raging storm of death simply won't let up. Saber retreats, unable to block it all. And then the final unblockable blow comes. Saber hangs in the air, twisting her body impossibly. Saber manages to defend against Berserker's titanic swing. It's all she can do to defend herself from the fatal blow. But because she can't completely brace herself against a giant tremendous swing, his attack sends her flying. After sailing in a wide arc, she falls to the ground. Before her back hits the ground, Saber turns in midair and lands on her feet. She manages to compose herself, but crimson blood stains her chest. 
Gee, I'm such an idiot. I've completely forgotten something crucial. I don't know how many times Cerberus can fight in a day, but this is Cerberus' third battle. On top of that, Saber hasn't hasn't healed from the wound Lancer inflicted on her chest earlier. Saber shifts her guard to protect her chest. Berserker moves in like a violent wind, striking Saber while she's hampered by her wound. His blows rain down on her back. I don't know what kind of magecraft Osaka used, but something burst against Berserker's body. From the amount of energy I can feel, the impact must have been equivalent to a large caliber pistol. Even that is meaningless. It barely even scratches him. He's in nullifying, nullifying magical energy like what Saber does. The attack just doesn't affect him. What? This guy's ridiculously durable. Despite that, Tosaka continues to cast her spell. Saber painfully lifts her head. She readies her sword, intent on continuing the fight. The sight of her in so much pain gets me moving again. No, run, Saber! I yell with all my might. She hears me. But she braces herself to confront an enemy she can't possibly compete with. Berserker's attacks are relentless. Saber weakens with every block. The end slowly creeps up on her. Where in that small frame of hers does such power come from? Saber doesn't retreat. She endures the Great Sword's furious attacks and tries to push Berserker back with sheer vigor. She has no chance of winning. Even though she knows her demise is inevitable, she holds her ground adamantly. Maybe it sends something from her. The monster silent until now suddenly roars. Its attacks are impossible to block. Its attacks rain down on her. Though her defense is flawless, but one strike finally sees her flying. It's a sign of something falling in the distance. Flesh blood stains on her armor. Her small frame shouldn't be able to rise, and yet... No. She stands up without thinking. Her actions say that she needs to keep going or else I'll be killed. Her actions. I realize I made a foolish decision. Berserker stops after defeating Saber. He doesn't so much as look at Osaka or me, it just waits for his master's orders. You can't win. My Berserker is the greatest hero of Greece. What? The greatest hero of Greece? Don't tell me he's... That's right. That demon before you is Hercules. What? What? You got freaking Hercules? That's not fair. He's the most atrocious, atrocious monster ever. And he's on a different level than any of the heroes Jutsu could summon and handle. The girl calling herself Illiga narrows her eyes in joy. Her eyes express elation from the anticipation of finishing off her enemies. There's no need to ask who she's expecting to kill. Saber. And what will I do? Am I going to fight that monster instead? I can't do that. Just getting near that thing without being prepared will be enough to stop my heart. I'm going to. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Why do they have to give me a choice right here? Ah oh man, hold on. What am I doing? Hold on, hold on. I go hard in the mother in paint. Hold on, I'll help Saber. This is so stupid. This is so stupid. But that's what I'm gonna do. I refuse to abandon someone when they're down. That's how I've always lived my life. And most importantly, 
I can't leave the girl who fought so hard to protect me. Okay, Berserker. She's gonna regenerate, so take her out now. Berserker rumbles back into movement. I. Why you? I punched that little girl in the jaw. I run forward as fast as I can. I can't possibly do anything against that monster, but I can at least hit that little girl with an RKO. What the? What did bro even? What did bro even say? What did he say? Get Saber out of the way and save him from Berserker's attack. Nope, that was stupid. I fall. Why? I was gonna shove Saber away from Berserker. Then I figured out what I'd do afterwards, so why? Why? Why am I on the ground unable to breathe? That might have been a stupid decision. <laughs> I hear surprised voices. First is Saber, who is in front of me now. Then there's Tosaka standing at a distance, looking aghast. Then for some reason, the girl calling herself Ilya stares down at me, dumbfounded. Uh, there's a gaping, ragged hole in the middle of my body. I'm on the ground. I'm on the asphalt. There's only a little blood, considering how big the wound is. I see some withered branch looking things and some shattered stuff and ah oh man that looks painful. All those parts scattered around. Oh I get it. I'm actually stupid. I didn't make it. I could never have pushed Saber out the way so I was just her shield. And then that ungodly huge machete thing took a good chunk out of my stomach. I guess I'm dying. <laughs> I can't believe I failed at a time like this. I tried my best to be a hero of justice, but I screwed up. But I screwed it all up when it really mattered. Nanda. Why? The silver-haired girl's face is blank as she speaks. After standing there dumbfounded, she just says, I've had enough. This is boring. She calls Berserker back without finishing Saber off. Rin, I'll kill you next time we meet. The girl leaves. After she disappears, I completely black out and no join Lucas. I lose consciousness. I'm really dead this time. I somehow survived when Lancer killed me last time, but my luck's definitely run out. There's no magecraft that could save a person who just lost half his body. What were you thinking? Don't you know I can't save you anymore? I hear a voice reprimanding me. It must be Tosaka. She sounds like she's really mad, and I feel bad. But I had no choice. I'm not good at everything like her. All I have to work with is my body. That's why the only thing I could do was risk it all using my own body. Is Shiro dead? <laughs> what, is Shiro actually dead? What is the flowchart? I actually... I might have actually killed Shiro. Holy crap. <laughs> oh my goodness. Alright, so main character pulls up for three episodes and dies. Alright, you know, love to see it. That's the end of the episode, guys. If y'all enjoyed, like, subscribe, leave a comment. i read them all. Tap into the next one. This was freaking insane. Holy crap. I, I don't know how I managed it, but leave it up to Zeke, Ken Zerk, Zeke a Million, the villain feeling Trilligan, um, Zeke the Freak, freaking Zeke. Leave it up to that guy to somehow get the main character killed three days into the story. Uh, <laughs> leave that up to me. Um, holy crap. The bro. I did not think fight scenes 
and visual novels would go this freaking hard. I did not expect that. And not a day in my life. How long am I recording? Not a day in my life did I think I'd be able to sit down and record three hours of a visual novel. I should have been exhausted with a headache and lightheaded about two hours ago. And I stuck through all three hours of this night, bro. That just shows how engaging this game can be. Man, I'm loving this game so much right now, I'm gonna be real. But I guess Rin's the main character now? Shirio's dead? <laughs> he doesn't exist anymore? No more Saber? <laughs> what the freak? Oh my goodness. But, oh my goodness. Peace out, I love y'all. Tap into the next one. Hope y'all are enjoying this series. I'm enjoying playing this game a lot.